सर किरण सर आहेत अच्छा मग मी सुरू करू आठ वाजले बरोबर हो सर एक्झॅक्ट आठ वाजले आठ वाजून एक मिनिट ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एव्हरीबडी वेल आय एम डॉक्टर नितीन लाड आय एम चेअरपर्सन ऑफ फर्टी फेस ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू अँड अलॉंग विथ मी डॉक्टर मिसेस कांचन देसले मॅडम शी इज अ को चेअरपर्सन ऑफ द थर्टी फेस ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू कॉन्फरन्स आय वेलकम ऑल माय जजेस अँड ऑल पार्टिसिपंट for the first session of 31st 2022 conference and this session consists of paper and poster presentation indeed it is a golden opportunity for all participants to design their research and that design their research work and present it to the renowned teachers and who's who in the field of infertility i wish all the best to all the participant and i also want to congratulate dr reshma rajboy madam for taking such a efforts and pain to organize this session i wish you again all the best and i officially allow you to start the session ma'am reshma ma'am you can start with the yes, program sir. Uh, yes sir very good morning to all uh such a pleasant morning and uh, piyush can you just on that inauguration lamp lightning with the auspicious hands of uh, dr nitin sir and dr kanchan ma'am sure ma'am piyush you only share please very first session of 31st 2022 redefining infertility challenges by ifs western maharashtra chapter in association with the nashik obstetric and gynecological society respected organizing chairpersons dr nitin lad sir and dr kanchan desle ma'am i request you to do online inauguration of this wonderful academic feast can you start no voice now i would like to invite our uh, judges for paper presentation uh, dr nalini bagul ma'am and dr kiran uh, patrol sir uh, they are both very senior uh, and uh, if i read the cv then i i will take one hour for both of them i welcome both of you sir uh, with uh, lots of uh, happiness so first i would like to call my first participant dr pratibha baldava dr pratibha baldava can you share your screen
she's having some issues i'll just call her to uh, uh, speak start start screen share and start to enable you start screen share ma piyush i'm saying that but it's showing host to disable part wait wait, wait. डेस्कटॉप फ्रॉम यूर I'm just open your presentation and then share screen. It will come automatically. Okay, I have to first open my presentation on the desktop. Yes, pre yeah, yes, yes. Open okay. your presentation. Yesterday. yesterday you didn't join. Uh, yesterday no. Yeah, I've opened it. Yeah, now go to sh share your screen. Share screen. Okay. Okay. It will come. Uh, just a minute. Share screen. Yeah, it's there. Okay. presentation ma'am yes please start yes ma'am yes okay a very good morning to one and all i am dr pratibha baldava uh, make slide share make slide show okay is that okay yeah okay then um, okay okay can can you So going forward. Start, start. You start. Uh, but can you see my slides? Yes, yes. You go ahead. Okay, but the scroll is not moving forward. Okay. Good morning. Sorry for the delay due to technical errors. Uh, I'm Dr. Pratibha Baldava from Sholapur. I am a practicing fertility fertility consultant for the last 14 years. Today I have joined this meeting to present an unusual case of recurrent pregnancy loss which was treated by intracytoplasmic sperm injection. I recall nothing in which in the times past has caused me more anxiety and doubt and to which no satisfactory rules from the books have been found than the treatment of abortion. This is as early as said by Dr. T G Thomas in 1908. <laughs> My patient, a 26-year-old patient, married since the last seven years of non-consensual marriage, had bad obstetric history. Her first pregnancy was a five months of intrauterine fetal demise, which was vaginally delivered in January 2016. Her second was a one and a half months of missed abortion, which was, for which a DNC was done in September 2016. Her third pregnancy also landed up as an intrauterine fetal demise and this was vaginally delivered in December 2017. When she conceived the fourth time they went from pillar to post and got 3 to 4 opinions done but all of which confirmed that she was having an 18 weeks of pregnancy with microcephaly with a lobar holoprosen cephaly hypertelorism bony abnormalities and severe symmetrical iugr with oligomnios which was query labeled as langer glitten syndrome and she aborted in september 2018 her fifth pregnancy was one and a half months of anabryonic pregnancy in january 2020 for which a dnc was done they were totally scared and were very scared to conceive even the next time they came to me for preconceptional counseling i went through the five bunches of files and found that all possible investigations including the karyotype of both the husband and wife were normal She was having mixed first and second trimester abortions for which no obvious cause was found. Complex all the more. This is the list of investigations of the wife showing a normal 46 karyotype, normal uterine shape, and all normal coagulation profiles, including a protein C activity, normal HbA1c, normal sugar levels. Her husband also had all normal investigations, including a normal 46 XY chromosome level. So I decided to seek help. 
I just I I sought the help of Mr. Dr. Chaitanya Data, who is a famous genesis, and he advised me to get a semen analysis and a sperm DNA fragmentation test done, and also a chromosome microarray analysis to find out genomic abnormalities in both the husband and the wife, in spite of having a normal karyotype. So now I could see some light at the end of the tunnel. I, I asked the husband to get the semen analysis, which showed a 22 million count, a 40% of grade 4 motility, and but the morphologically normal sperms was less than 4%. The sperm DNA fragmentation index was 22%. They were very cooperative and got the chromosome microarray analysis also done, for which the wife's result were normal, but for the husband, the chromosome microarray analysis showed deletion of chromosome 8. There was a loss of almost 20.9 million base pairs and this was the reason for having all the problems that she was having during conception to reach a viable pregnancy and it was also the cause for her Langer-Glidden syndrome baby. So microdeletion on chromosome 8 is one of the causes for Langer-Glidden syndrome. So I started counseling the couple after the results. The husband was totally devastated and depressed feeling that he will never be able to father a viable child. So I had to give them the treatment options. Since the problem was with the sperm, the treatment option included giving, uh, opting them for IUI donor or to go for ICSI with monogenetic pre-genetic testing of the embryos. So what is pre-genetic testing? I had to counsel them before I could give them the options. Pre-genetic testing with monogene testing is that the embryos are formed by ICSI and a biopsy of these embryos are taken and they are checked for the monogenes or monogenetic abnormality which was found in the previous babies. If those Sorry, embryos I have to found... disturb, only one minute is remaining. Okay. So they went for ICSI and then uh, they, are, they went for ICSI, two embryos were found to be viable and these two embryos were transfer, transplanted and she had twins pregnancy. Finally, they were delivered by cesarean section and two, she had two healthy babies. Their tears of joy had no end. What I would like to impress, what I would like to impose is that in routine obstetric practice, we feel that ICSI is a treatment option only for infertility, but it can also be offered to patients with bad obstetric history with, pay, with RPL. We, I felt that chromosome abnormalities was a cause for first trimester abortions and not for IFDs, but it is not so, as this case proves the contrary. A combination of both first and tri second trimester losses can still be due to chromosomal and genetic abnormalities. Genetic abnormalities exist despite having a normal karyotype in the form of micro deletions and chromosome microarray analysis is the recent trend for prenatal diagnostic testing. What is, what is important is that what I found in this case, what was unusual is that first and second trimester abortions both were being caused because of genetic abnormalities and CMA and ICSI with pre-genetic testing is a treatment option where healthy embryos can be found out, transplanted and they can still have viable babies. Thank you. Are there any questions from judges? What, uh, what I, would, I would also like to say is that Chromosome microarray analysis is a step higher than karyotype. In karyotype, what is seen is we only see the large aberrations or we see the entire chromosome itself. But when we do a chromosome microarray analysis, gene mutations which are never detectable microscopically on the chromosome, a single gene defect which does not cause a chromosome to be abnormal or the structure to be abnormal or the number to be abnormal can be picked up in chromosome microarray analysis. So these patients which who run from post to pillar with bad obstetric history and have all the investigation normal, we can offer them chromosome microarray analysis, find out the defect and offer them ICSI so that they can have the embryo biopsy done and the healthy embryos can be transferred and they can reach a, uh, their own, they can have their own babies, healthy own babies. Thank you, Dr. Right. Pratibha. Very lucid uh, presentation. Uh, can you have questions, Dr. Nalini ma'am or Dr. Kiran sir? One minute uh, is there remaining, one minute for her. Just one question, madam. It's not a question, but just just out of your this experience, I would like to know whom do you like to advise such tests? 
So all those it is patients, definitely not a routine investigation. Okay. Not a routine investigation, so it is expensive and it requires a mm -hmm. lot of perseverance and counseling to the patients to inform them that this is a test higher than karyotype. They have already gone to so many places, have got no answers for their queries, then to counsel them that, that so I will advise this only to those patients who are having repeated bad obstetric history for which all basic investigations including the karyotype was normal and no cause was found. So to them I would advise a chromosome microarray analysis and if that is defective then to refer them to ICSI with pre genetic testing, which is of three types uh, PGTA, PGTM, and PGTSR. PGTM is something which is done only for monogene defects, PGTA, which is done for aneuploidy, and PGTSR, which is done for structural rearrangements. So these defects can be found and only the healthy embryos can be transferred, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to call our next participant, Dr. Vishnu Priya. Yes, ma'am. Next is Dr. Arti Vagle. Uh, just had you joined, Dr. Arti Vagle? Uh, yes, ma'am. I've joined. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. Can I start, ma'am? Yes. You can start, Dr. Vishnu Priya. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, judges and my seniors and my respected colleagues. I'm Dr. Vishnu Priya, DGO resident. I got a good opportunity to speak about the topic, a study of role of hysteroscopy in infertility. Introduction. Nowadays, infertility is a ban of modern living. It inflicts an emotional trauma on an individual for being unable to fulfill their parenthood. So, hysteroscopy has an increased demand for diagnostic and therapeutic intervention for management of infertility. The materials and methods, it, it was a retrospective study carried out on 15 page, 50 patients at Nandadip Hospital, yes, Shatara IVF Center for the period of one year. And the age group of my patient is in between 25 to 40 years. The inclusive criteria are both primary and in secondary infertility and exclusive criteria are both active and pelvic inflammatory diseases, cervical vaginal infections, and current intrauterine pregnancies. The aim of my study is correlation of hysteroscopic finding with ultrasonography in a case of infertility, prevalence of abnormal hysteroscopic finding in patients presenting with infertility, and to assess the role of hysteroscopy in workup of female infertility. After the ethical committee permission, all the preoperative investigations was done and ultrasonography was done to the, all the patients. All the preoperative investigations and medications was carried out, followed by under short GA and local, the hysteroscopy was performed under a diagnostic sheet of size 4 mm and 30 degree telescope. The vaginoscopy was done, followed by an examination of external os and it endocervical canal after entering the uterine cavity all the walls and both the ostia was visualized endometrial sampling was taken and sent to histopathology and tbpcr the observation and result according to age-wide distribution almost 44 percentage of uh, is at the age group of 31 to 35 years when i compared the sonography with Sonography with an hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy, the sensitivity of sonography is comparatively less when I compared with hysteroscopy. For example, nearly 66% 6 of polyp was diagnosed in primary and 2 in secondary, followed by septum 6% was diagnosed in primary and 5% in secondary. Mostly 37% of cervical erosions were found in primary and 27% of erosion was found in cervical erosion in secondary and almost 50 percent of cervical findings were normal. The hysteroscopic intrauterine findings are, the maximum number of findings during hysteroscopy is 31 percent is polyp followed by septum and nearly 31 percent were found normally. In secondary, it is equal that 22 percent was found as polyp and 5 percent was septum, 11 percent was adhesions and almost 50 percent in secondary infertility was found normal. The endometrial Endometrial findings were nearly 31% of polypoidal findings were found in the primary and 16% of polypoidal findings were found in secondary and almost 37% of had normal, no abnormalities. The tubal factors are nearly 15% were found in primary was blocked tubes, 
followed by fibrose and nearly 1% 33% uh, are found not seen and 75% were found normal after the diagnostic hysteroscopy at the same sitting sitting we underwent an interventional procedure the maximum procedure was polypectomy in primary nearly 31% underwent polypectomy and 22% underwent polypectomy in secondary followed by additional lysis then metroplasty and nearly 12% of for patients underwent an osteal opening and in secondary 11% of patient underwent for osteo opening this is a diagrammatic and the discussion i have compared my study with an other studies for example um, by ac d sa rosa d c silva who did the comparative study to determine the routine office hysteroscopy in the investigations of infertility couples before art and also i compared my study with the hermans a shender d who compared the diagnostic hysteroscopy as a primary tool tool in the basic infertility workup these are the other studies which i have compared the evolution out of outpatient hysteroscopy saline infusion hysterosonography hysterosalpingography in infertile women and hysteroscopy prior to in vitro fertilization one minute remaining and diagnostic accuracy of transvaginal sonography in a in the detection of uterine abnormalities in an infertile woman the conclusion of my topic is in the view of above finding of the study it seems worthwhile to consider hysteroscopy has the first line of investigation for the evolution of female infertility after the initial investigation within the normal limit and when we compare the sonography with an hysteroscopy the sensitivity of sonography is little less when it compared with the hysteroscopy thank you judges and thank you thank you vishnu uh any questions from judges yes we having two minutes yes ma'am yes yes dr vishnu priya yes ma'am how many patients you correlated this uh, hysteroscopy with the sonography i'm nearly 25% patients were compared with the uh, almost 50 is my study ma'am nearly 25 to 30 percentage i compared with the sonography ma'am and sonography has correlated with the hysteroscopy same findings were there in the hysteroscopy Ma'am, almost it is few polyps were missed and few small symptoms got missed, ma'am. In when I compared with the hysteroscopy, I got the hysteroscopic finding which was not mentioned in sonography, like small symptom. Okay, you have done uh, sonography. Uh, you have done it, and then same. Uh, uh, you have done hysteroscopy also. Means you have done the sonography and the hysteroscopy both. No, ma'am. First we went for so hysteroscopy, the sonography which. We got from other investigations. We got. I from got the data from the. I got oh, the data from the sonography. Okay. Okay. If you do sonography correctly, you can find the. Uh, you can very well correlate with the hysteroscopy findings. Okay. So it is better to do sonography on your own only. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, any question from Dr. Kiran sir, or uh, shall I call next? Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Nalini because the uh, ultrasonography is definitely non-invasive tool, and it should be routinely done first. And then, when you suspect, then you should go for this such invasive modality. Of course, few things, as she has rightly pointed out, will be those uh, things which will be missed in ultrasonography can be picked up on a hysteroscopy. Thank you. thank you sir for your inputs uh, stop sharing vishnu uh, now i would like to call dr aarti bagle next participants dr aarti bagle please share your screen um shall i start yeah start beta Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Arti, and I'm here to present before you uh, the paper "Serum Estradiol Levels on the Day of Ovulation Trigger and Its Correlation with Oocyte Quality and Subsequent Pregnancy Outcomes in IVF or ICSI Cycle." So, over the last decade, India has seen an increase in the number of uh, infertile couples undergoing ART. So, various factors like stress, lifestyle changes, and the ongoing COVID pandemic has given a boost to this rise. The National Registry of India has predicted that in 2022, about 3.5 lakh couples in India will undergo ART. So the aims and objectives of my study was to correlate the E2 levels on the day of ovulation trigger with oocyte quality, 
and to evaluate the subsequent pregnancy outcomes. The inclusion criteria for my study included ONEC IVF cycle and embryo, frozen embryo transfer cycles, and the exclusion criteria was fresh ET cycles, donor cycles when there was no embryo formation and uterine factors. The material and methods included it was a prospective study which was conducted uh, uh, at the tertiary care center with a sample size of 50 women undergoing IVF for various indications from March 2021 to March 2022. Uh, the, the patients underwent a uh, over controlled ovarian hyperstimulation using the antagonist stimulation protocol and the trigger was given on maturity which was re either recombinant HCG, GnRH agonist or a dual trigger and E2 levels were done on the day of the trigger. Open pickup was done 35 hours post-trigger transvaginally and the oocytes were graded. All M2 oocytes were uh, underwent ICSI whereas the M1 oocytes uh, underwent uh, IVF and fertilization was confirmed 16 to 20 hours post-IVF or ICSI with the uh, with help of you know uh, by looking at the two pronuclei. Uh, the embryos were taken from day 1 to day 5, that is a blastocyst stage using a sequential media and were cryopreserved and one or two blastocysts were transferred in the subsequent optimum cycle. For the purpose of our study, we have uh, divided the E2 levels as group 1 which was less than 2000, group 2, 2000 to 3000, group 3, 3000 to 4000 and group 4, more than 4000. The oocyte grading was done as grade 1 with no anomaly grade 2 with one anomaly and grade 3 with more than or equal to two anomalies. These were the parameters that were assessed. Uh, talking about the results, so when the baseline parameters that is the demographic factors of the study groups were compared in relation to the E2 levels, uh, the uh, factors compared were age, BMI and the duration of infertility, but we did not find any significant variance between the groups, uh, E2 level groups and the demographic parameters. When the ovarian reserve tests were compared, so they were either compared on the laboratory investigations, that is the FSH, E2 levels and AMH on day 2 and the AFC, that is the USG parameter. Talking about the laboratory parameters, uh, although the estradiol levels, as you can see, was highest in group 3, it was not statistically significant. However, the difference in AMH values was highly significant with 0.004 with highest AMH values seen in group 4 women. Uh, AFC in relation to serum estradiol levels was also compared and it was seen that AFC was highest in group 4 women and this conversely proves that women with higher AFC and AMH values have a higher number of follicles and when stimulated have a higher estradiol levels. The stimulation drugs which were used were HMG for 11 women, RFSH for 2 women and a combination of the two for 37 women. And when E2 levels were compared between the groups, it was seen that although it was higher, the E2 levels were higher in group uh, which was used both RFSS and HMG, uh, the results were not statistically significant. Uh, stimulation drugs when compared with oocyte grading had 11 women in grade 1 uh, oocytes, 20 with grade 2 oocytes and 19 with grade 3 oocytes. However, as the serum E2 levels increased from group 1 to group 4, there was no significant difference which was noted in the oocyte quality. For, uh, correlation with the ovulation trigger, so GnRH agonist was used in 24 women, dual trigger was used in uh, a total of 11 and RHCG in 15 patients. And by One minute time, remaining. Yes ma'am. Chi-square test, this was not statistically significant. However, we cannot comment upon the effect of trigger on oocyte quality. Uh, comparison of E2 levels with oocytes, so the highest number of oocytes were seen in group 3, that is in uh, patients with uh, serum E2 levels between 3000 to 4000 and M2 oocytes were obtained in uh, women with grade four, uh, group 4. The fertilization rate was not significant when compared with the E2 levels between the groups and it was calculated by the number of fertilized oocytes upon the number of injected oocytes. The overall pregnancy rate, however, was about 74%. As you can see, it was higher in group 4, but it was not statistically significant. The implantation rate, uh, which was about 92%, was also not statistically significant. And the clinical pregnancy rate, that was the evidence of cardiac activity, was also not statistically significant when compared with E2 levels. So we can say that E2 levels can be used to uh, predict the number of oocytes that can be retrieved and the risk of OHSS. 
but there was no correlation with the oocyte quality. So high levels of E2 can have poor quality oocytes and vice versa. When compared with other studies, our study results were similar to that seen uh, by Pillai Avni in 2019 and Malti et al. in 2021. The drawbacks of our study were the limited sample size, fresh embryo transfer outcomes were not evaluated, and the embryo quality and the sperm quality was not taken into consideration. So to conclude, I would say that the serum E2 levels are useful in determining the number and maturity, but that same can be done by using a USG guidance. Uh, USG guidance. So we cannot extrapolate the results of E2 that we do in our IVF cycle to define the oocyte quality. These are my references. Thank you. Very lucid presentation, Dr. Arti. Uh, may I have questions from uh, our esteemed judges? Yes. Hello, Dr. Arti. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, which protocol you have used, uh, means which drug you have used, you have used the so antagonist protocol? Antagonist in, protocol was used and for yes. stimulation, we either used HMG, a recombinant FSH or a combination that was uh, uh, one after the other. Have you correlated the uh, RFSH and the uh, HMG with the oocyte quality? Yes, ma'am, I have. The stimulation drugs were used uh, along with the, uh, to correlate with the oocyte quality and we did not find any uh, difference between the two. So whenever, so 11 women had grade 1, grade 2 and uh, 20 had grade 2 embryos and uh, sorry, oocytes and 19 had grade 3 oocytes, but it was not statistically significant. Okay. Okay, now I would like to our next participant, Dr. Munmai Hemani. Is she there? Dr. Munmai. Okay. Dr. Munmai. Yes, Yeah. Uh, increase your volume, laptop volume. I can't hear you, beta. No, we can't hear you, Munmai. Uh, Piyush, can you help her out? Piyush is there? Yes, ma'am. Can you help her just uh, uh, some tricks? Her voice is not audible. Yeah. These um, okay. Ma'am, just click on the uh, little arrow beside the mic button. And when it says select a microphone, uh, click on same as system. Are you get, or, getting on my? Yeah, she can hear us. Okay, fine. Let's try that. And uh, uh, also, I couldn't hear you. Just tell her to share her screen. Yeah, please share your screen. But she won't be able to present. No? Okay. Mumbai, um, just check. I will. I would like to uh, till that time. I will take a next participant. And uh, these technical issues can happen. You can present later on. Mumbai, try to uh, log in from another device. Another yeah. Laptop or so another I device. would like to call now, uh, Doctor Udaya Bandaru. Bandaru, Doctor Udaya yes, Bandaru. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please start, beta. Uh, to both of my esteemed judges, Dr. Udaya Bandaru, please. Uh, Share your screen and start, Bitter. Yes, ma'am. I'm sharing. Is it visible, ma'am? Uh, it's a kind request to all participants. Check your internet connectivity your voice right now all participants please start you can start yes ma'am ma is my share uh, screen yeah, yeah. Visible absolutely now? fine yes yes, yes. absolutely yes, fine please start yes ma'am good morning everyone i am dr udya kiran bandaru uh, and this is my study uh, which is a study of correlation of endometrial morphology and subendometrial vascularity with pregnancy rate in fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles. Coming to the background of the study, for any successful implantation, there is a close interaction between a good quality embryo and the receptive endometrium. 
and various diagnostic tools they have been proposed to estimate this endometrial receptivity and which include sonographic measures like the endometrial thickness endometrial pattern and endometrial doppler and usually endometrial uterine um, uh, doppler study of the uterine artery it does not reflect the actual blood flow to the endometrium whereas endometrial and subendometrial blood flow it can be used objectively and it is a uh, reliable measure uh, uh, with a three dimensional power ultrasonography so the markers of endometrial receptivity are a triple layered endometrial pattern endometrial thickness of more than 7 mm and a good blood flow which is zone 3 and 4 they are proposed as markers of the good endometrial receptivity the aim and objective of my study is to assess the predictive value of this endometrial thickness endometrial morphology and this endometrial vascularity with pregnancy rate in fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles we have done this study in 76 women who are undergoing ivf treatment at our hospital and the ethical committee approval was approved for the study we have included the patients with tubal factor male factor pcos endometriosis and unexplained infertility whereas patients with congenital uterine anomalies adenomyosis uterine fibroid polyp intrauterine adhesion endometrial cocks and distorted endometrial cavity were excluded from the study coming to the method and methodology part for the fresh embryo transfer cycle we have used a antagonist protocol and on the day 2 of the menses we have measured the patient estradiol progesterone fsh lh along with the sonography to rule out any cyst uh, or corpus luteum from the previous cycle and uh, we have adjusted the dose of gonadotropin based on the age the antral follicular count the amh bmi and response to previous stimulation and gonadotropins are started from day 2 or day 3 of the menstrual cycle and we have done a, a tvs scan from day 4 to 5 of stimulation and it was repeated every alternate day or if need till the day of hcg uh, in the uh, sonography tvs part we have first looked at the endometrial thickness endometrial thickness in the mid sagittal plane it is the thickest part between a highly reflective echogenic line and we have categorized the patients as group 1 where the endometrial thickness was less than 7 mm group 2 where the endometrial thickness was 7 to 14 mm and group 3 was patients with endometrial thickness more than 14 mm later on we have seen endometrial pattern to be either a triple line or a non triple line if it is a triple line it is a central hyperechoic line which is surrounded by two hypoechoic layers later on we have activated the power doppler function to evaluate the endometrial subendometrial blood flow and the blood supply reaching up to the hyperechoic la outer layer of the endometrium is the zone 2 zone 3 where the blood supply is reaching up to the hypoechoic inner layer of the endometrium and zone 4 where the blood supply is reaching till the endometrial cavity and the doppler settings are as follows they should show a resistance index of 0.49 to 0.59 and the pulsatility index should be between 1 to 2 and these blood vessels should cover a maximum of 5 mm area of a particular zone 3 and zone 4 of the endometrium uh, when coming to the trigger we have given recombinant hcg as a trigger and uh, when there are uh, three follicles which are measuring 17 to 18 mm and uh, oocyte retrieval was done 35 to 36 after hours after the trigger in case if the estrogen level was more than 4000 progesterone more than 1.5 and more than 15 to 20 follicles were aspirated all the embryos were frozen as there is a risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome we have given the patients progesterone and luteal uh, progesterone support in form of vaginal progesterone and luteal phase support was also given in form of vaginal progesterone for the fresh embryo transfer cycle one minute remaining udaya we have down regulated the patients using a injection luprite depot and is, uh, endometrium was built up with estradiol valerate and a transvaginal sonography was done to look for the endometrial thickness endometrial pattern and the endometrial doppler and uh, progesterone injections were started once the endometrial thickness was more than 7 mm and uh, uh, the luteal phase support was given uh, if beta hcg is more than 50 it is considered as a positive pregnancy rate clinical pregnancy is defined as appearance of g sac with the appropriate lysing hcg levels whereas biochemical pregnancy where is there is no g sac Uh, uh, an embryo grading method we have used this is a day 3 embryo transfer with eight cell this is a day 3 embryo transfer with one and two are merging and three is a eight cell stage and this is a blastocyst transfer coming to the results part in our study of 76 patients who underwent ivf treatment 75% had primary infertility and 25% had secondary infertility out of the 76 patients 40 patients underwent fresh transfer cycle and 36 patients underwent frozen thymbryo cycle transfer 
coming to the demographic pattern only bmi was found to be significant among the pregnant groups and basic laboratory part like basal fsh lh e2 progesterone amh gonadotropin dose everything was found to be insignificant whereas blastocyst quality of embryo transfer was found to be significant among the pregnant group coming to the important parameters like endometrial thickness it was found to be non significant in my study group whereas endometrial pattern pattern a and pattern b and endometrial blood flow reaching up to zone 3 and zone 4 were found to be significant comparing my study to other studies in my study the endometrial thickness was not found to be significant whereas studies conducted by mostafa et al and neeta singh et al they found that endometrium more than uh, uh, 8 to 14 mm was found to be significant coming to the endometrial pattern in my study the patients having pattern a and pattern b were found to be significant and they found to be positive for the pregnancy whereas the study done by khalifa et al and zaidi et al did not find any significance the most important part is the endometrial doppler my study has found to be significant among the uh, uh, pregnant groups whereas study done by mostafa et al and neeta singh et al and manisha chaudhary did not find any significance i would like to conclude that a combination of endometrial thickness along with the doppler uh, analysis it will be a simple and effective tool to improve the pregnancy outcome and should be incorporated into the routine clinical practice and if the likelihood of any unsuccessful cycle existed by this pattern and the doppler the patient could be informed prior to the transfer of cycle and thus the embryos could be frozen and the patient will not be disappointed either by the failure of the current cycle or the wastage of the embryos uh, one of the limitation of the study is because of the limited sample size uh, and uh, we would like to put forward and recommend that along with the endometrial thickness and endometrial doppler adding a 3d power doppler it can be useful as a prognostic tool uh, for improving the pregnancy outcomes in infertile women i thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity thank you udaya uh, yes, may i may i have questions from judges we can have one minute discussion only yes very nice uh, presentation dr udaya Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma yeah, you have done. You, uh, your cut off is seven millimeter, no? Before uh, that, uh, less. Uh, than, yes. Yeah. We have categorized the patients into three groups, ma'am. Group one was less than seven mm. Group two, seven to fourteen mm, and group three is more than fourteen mm. And uh, 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 unfortunately, we were not find to um, not able to find any significant between the pregnant and non-pregnant group. But the ideally would be seven to fourteen mm. so uh, how many patients of uh, uh, less than 7 mm conceived uh, only one patient ma'am how many patients were there with less than 7 mm of endometrial only thickness one. only uh, one that uh, two patients two patients and uh, one conceived in it one patient it was it was a very nice uh, idea huh? it should yes, be yes, uh, studied yes ma'am the power doppler actually is emerging a lot usually uterine artery yeah. uh we cannot assess uh, i mean it um, we cannot see how much the blood flow is actually going to the cavity by uterine but if we take the subendometrial and endometrial doppler it is a very prognostic uh, value based on the zones and then we can go ahead accordingly right right thank you thank you udaya and thank you judges and also dr kanchan ma'am i would like to call next our participant dr meeka kirthana is she there dr meeka yes ma'am Dr. Mika, can you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kirtana. Uh, I am doing my uh, residency in second year uh, from uh, PMT Loni. I would like to present a paper uh, based on the research uh, title "Diagnostic Role of Hysterolaparoscopy in Female Infertility in Rural Population." a uh, background is although population explosion is a major problem in india infertility appears to be a problem in about 15% of population even now this is due to the trend towards delayed child bearing due to achieve to achieve socio economic educational and professional goals among in india um, for primary infertility pid and std prevalence is very high and the prevalence of primary infertility in india is between 3.9 and 16.8% in this regard some tests should be included in routine workup for infertility which can outline the way of treatment by identifying the precise underlying cause diagnostic hysterolaparoscopy is one such tool which requires resources available in low resource settings 
uh, laparoscopy is a minimally invasive surgical procedure in which gynecologist examines organs of pelvic organs to both identify and sometimes treat causes of infertility. Chroma perturbation is one such method which can be in included under laparoscopy to assess tubal patency as well. Hysteroscopy is a surgical process used to examine uterine, ca active, uterine cavity for abnormalities causing infertility. Studies done in past showed hysterolaparoscopy have 100% specificity. In view of the above facts, present study was conducted to evaluate the different causes of primarily, primary and secondary infertility with diagnostic hysterolaparoscopy as primary tool of investigation. The aims and objectives include to study the role of laparoscopy and hysteroscopy in the evaluation of female fertility in rural area and to diagnose and correct specific causes of tubal, uterine and ovarian factors of infertility whenever possible. Also, uh, to diagnose medical conditions like tuberculosis, etc. associated with infertility and their treatment. Materials and methods used. Uh, this is a this study conducted as a prospective observational study uh, conducted in women presenting with primary or secondary infertility at Pravara Rural Hospital, which is basically a tertiary care teaching hospital in Maharashtra during the period of November 2020 to Jan 2022. The source of data was the indoor case files of 85 women presenting with primary, primary and secondary infertility. The, my inclusion criteria was all cases of infertility presenting with age of 19 years and above, and there is evidence of tubal disease or uterine anomaly on USG and any unfortain, unexplained infertility when all the other tests are normal. The exclusion criteria include recent uterine perforation and medically unfit patients who could not get anesthesia clearance and acute pelvic inf infections are also excluded. So 85 women satisfied the criteria and were included as study, study subjects. History was taken, investigations and basic examination performed and patients were posted for the procedure after pre-anesthetic checkup and well-informed written consent taken. The age, menstrual history, BMI, hysteroscopic findings and laparoscopic findings were collected in a structured, pre-validated and pre-tested proforma. Patients were discharged on the next day with post-operative period uneventful. The observation and results were not noted as follows. The cases were diagnosed distributed according to age, where most of them were categorized under the age of 21 to 25, approximately 40, 40 of them, as the age of marriage in India is usually less. And the next major criteria, next major uh, cat category being uh, 26 to 30 years. Uh, coming to menstrual history, approximately 13% uh, of them gave menstrual abnormalities, suggesting possibility of ovarian factors causing infertility. The th third variable I've chosen was uh, body mass index. Majority of them, uh, like about 55% of them, uh, were under, in the BMI of 18.5 to 24.9, which is a norm, which is actually which is the which is considered the normal range. As most of the people I have done study were belonging to the middle class population. Very few of them, like seven patients, approximately 8% suggested obesity, which can raise the possibility of PCOS. Hysteroscopic findings, which were found in the patients which we studied, were ostia not visualized, but the ma in major part of them, we found ad intrauterine additions present in approximately 11% of them. Laparoscopic findings in uterus were found, most of them to be normal, but in one patient, we found congenital anomaly to be bicornuate uterus, and in two of them, we found fi fibroids. Uh, in the tubes, we, we had only one finding, uh, that is hydrosalpings, we found in 15 of them, when we posted 85 of them. And uh, as a part of laparoscopy, chromoperturbation was done um, in all of them, in which uh, maximum, maximum of their tubes were patent, but unilateral tubal block was seen in 11% of them and bilateral block was seen in 10% of them. Only one minute is remaining. Be precise, beta. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in, in ovaries, only 21%, uh, 18, 18 of them had PCOD. And this was also uh, useful because simultaneously ovarian drilling was done in these cases, which was a therapeutic way also. Pelvic findings in laparoscopy were also very significant because in 6% of them, pelvic additions were found and in approximately 10% of them, endometriosis was found. Stage, uh, uh, grade 3 and 4 endometriosis. 
discussion and conclusion laparoscopy has become gold standard for diagnosis of pelvic and peritoneal diseases nowadays as direct visualization of abdominal and pelvic organs allows a definitive diagnosis hysteroscopy has been proved to be a definitive method for evaluation of uterine cavity and associated anomalies in the present study no major complications were observed at the time of procedure wherever possible it is patients were advised to follow for the treatment of factors detected and treated till this time three patients have reported with conceptions in whom therapeutic methods have been done thus this study shows that diagnostic hysterolaparoscopy can be considered as a primary investigation for infertility evaluation with the view of low complication rates minimal time requirement and negligible effect on post operative course these are my references thank you thank you uh, kirtana uh, can we have questions Dr. yes kirtana, how many like patients no uh, how many patients in your study were found to have endometriosis or uh, pelvic tuberculosis uh, sir pelvic tuberculosis has not been found sir endometrial tuberculosis was seen in 8% of them 8% sir okay and endometriosis endometriosis in 8% of them sir pelvic tuber pelvic uh, tuberculosis was not diagnosed sir okay because these these are the two very common things we which you can pick up in laparoscopy kirtana what is your criteria for laparoscopy in which patients you will advise laparoscopy ma'am do, those patients who have been already diagnosed a case those who have actually undefined infertility or the ones who have a clinical evidence yeah they have a usg report for a definitive diagnosis so all cases of uh, infertility you will uh, advise laparoscopy no ma'am uh, for those who actually require therapeutic for the, for patients whom this hysteroscopy serves as a therapeutic purpose also for them it is a definitive indication but the ones for whom undetermined infertility is there for them to we have we advise diagnostic hysteroscopy when you call the unexplained infertility uh, ma'am uh, hormonal once their hormonal profile is done and on usg or uh, there is no significant finding then we call it as undefined infertility see there are clear cut criteria for laparoscopy not all patient should undergo laparoscopy uh, here by when there is a pelvic uh, any surgery in the previous uh, case if it is there then one can uh, advise her for uh, laparoscopy then usg finding as you have already told in the patients of dysmenorrhea if the patient is having severe dysmenorrhea we can suspect endometriosis and the we can advise laparoscopy it is not to be advised to all the patients even for the unexplained infertility uh, it is not to be advised unless and until there is sure sure cause for this thank you so much very interactive sessions are going on i am so happy now i would like to call uh dr munmai hemani is she ready now with the uh, uh, technical issues dr munmai dr munmai yes ma'am yeah fine fantastic please share your screen beta yes ma'am next is dr harshada please be ready Now are you able to see now? Yeah, fine, fine. You just uh, start. Good morning, everyone. Today is my topic is on role of ethanol estradiol and cyprobutyl acetate or ovarian volume in PCOS. Uh, PCOS is a globally emerging problem and lands up into subic fertility. It's an hyperandrogenic condition diagnosed with sonological evidence of a uh, decrease increased ovarian volume and evolution abnormal uh, androgen levels as biochemical markers. 
Neptune and acetate and ethyl have been approved as a standard combination to regularize menstrual cycle, treat androgen dependent condition in women such as acne, severia, hirsutism, female pattern hair loss, and hyperandrogenism due to polycystic ovarian syndrome, and also decrease the uh, volume and stroma, which is increased in PCOS. A regular menstrual cycle with normal ovarian volume with less resistance from androgen decreases subfertility and increases chances of ovulation in PCOS patient, hence improving, improving the pregnancy rate. This is a final outcome action of combination serving as a pre-induction protocol. In an objective of the study was to estimate the effect of standard available combination of ethanol estradiol and cyprodin acetate on increased ovarian volume volume in infertile patient of the reproductive age group to estimate the number of women ovulating after induction and confirming it with positive pregnancy test. Material, it is, uh, it is a prospective observational non-comparative study. Uh, source of data, the patient attending the infertility OPD at SMBT, Dhamangao Nashik from 1st January 2021 to 31st July 2021 with sonological evidence of PCOS with increased volume of more than 9 cc bilateral along with any of the two that is uh, anovolution or hyperandrogenism were included in the study. The inclusion criteria included the infertile PCOS patient of reproductive age group with sonological evidence of increased ovarian volume, clinical and biochemical evidence of PCOS. Exclusion criteria included PCOS patient with normal ovarian volume, not willing to participate in the study. This is the methodology we did. The infertile uh, patient of the inclusion criteria was selected. Then they were divided into three uh, groups according to the ovarian volume and given the three cycles of ethanol estradiol and cyprodin acetate from day two of the menses. Ovarian volume were assessed by TVS at first visit and again after the three, uh, third and the third cycle, third and the sixth cycle of the treatment. Materials and method, uh, depending upon the ovarian volume, uh, it was divided into three groups. Group one consists of ovarian volume of 10 to 16 cc, which included 25 patients. Group two, uh, it was between, uh, the volume of between 16 to 21, that included 15 patients. And group three, which was more than 21 cc, uh, in, which included 10 patients. So after three months, uh, this was my observation, uh, after three months of uh, ethanol estradiol and cyprotin acetate, out of 50 patients recruited, 20 had responded and 22 did not respond to the treatment. Out of those 22, 10 opted for ovarian drilling and 12 uh, continued with the medical line that was they were given again three months a cycle of cyprotin acetate and ethanol estradiol. After six months, that uh, after six months, these twelve patients, uh, after these twelve patients, eight uh, eight uh, opted for ovarian drilling and four responded to the treatment. Uh, the pregnancy rate after ovulation induction with promofen cited and planned coitus, uh, it was seen in 44% in group 1 patients, 33% uh, percent in group 2 patients, and 40% uh, in group, four patient, uh, group 3 patients. This is a chart showing uh, the methodology at the, we did at the 50 recruits and we gave the three months of crimson to them, the combination of cyproprene acetate and ethanol estradiol. Out of those, um, four uh, out of those uh, 28, uh, 22 opted, uh, 22 were unresponder and 10 opted for uh, drilling and eight were uh, again uh, into cycle. Result. At the end of three months, 50 patients out of 28, so, uh, 50 patients, 28 showed reduction volume and were put into metformin if they were obese and 10 were non-responder and opted for ovarian drilling. At the end of six months, out of 12 remaining patients, four cases showed reduction in volume and 10 eight respond, and eight were non-responders opted for ovarian drilling. Final pregnancy rate after pre-induction protocol of ethanol estradiol plus uh, clomiphene citrate in infertile cases was seen in 20 patients after ovulation induction and planned coitus. Conclusion, it can be concluded that standard combination of ethanol estradiol and clomiphene citrate for three to six months reduces the, uh, reduces the increase over in volume in PCOS and can serve as pre-induction protocol in low resource setting. Following this combination therapy, 
ovulation induction and IUI or plant coitus can be a modality of treatment of treating infertile obesivus patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Munmay. Uh, can you have questions? Munmay, I would like to know you took that word and volume as the only uh, criteria to include the patients in your study? No, sir. Or to diagnose PCOS? Uh, no, sir. Uh, there were biochemical markers also done. Uh, but since, mm -hmm. our, uh, since our uh, patients coming here are uh, belonging to low socioeconomic status, biochemical marker was done only if there were um, history or, or uh, abnormal at the first visit and they were not repeated after three months. What I mean to say, there is no not even need of doing biochemical markers in all patients. Even yes, clinical sir. criteria is showing hyperandrogenism is sufficient yes, to diagnose PCOS. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Have you uh, advised them the lifestyle changes? How many of them uh, responded for this? Uh, uh, see, PCOS are obese patients. How many yes, of them have responded for the, to the lifestyle changes and then the ovarian volume? Ma'am, everyone was advised lifestyle changes. Everyone along, uh, everyone was advised lifestyle changes. And if the patient were obese, we started them on metformin along with it. But have they reduced weight also? Yes, ma'am. That you have not monitored, it seems. Yes, ma'am. We have monitored that also. But hmm. only few showed that changes. And how many patients... See, you have done the... Uh, ovarian drilling. Yes, ma'am. To be advised for this PCOS patient. Uh, which patients you have advised ovarian drilling? Ma'am, who did not respond and some and some of them are very anxious, so they uh, couldn't uh, understand. So that's why they uh, they were subjected to ovarian drilling, and obese patient also include was there included. See, ovarian drilling is not the uh, in indication for this PCOS patient. Only if they are resistant uh, PCOS yes, and if AMI is increased. And secondly, the AMH is more than 7. You have not done the AMH also? In AMH all patients. Mm. It is not done, no? Mumbai, can you hear? Yes, ma'am. He is not audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You have not done AMH to all patients, no? I think the connection is not there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, may I call next? Next. next. But I, uh, one minute. I will congratulate uh, Dr. Saudamini with her student. She is our mm -hmm. NOGS uh, member and very proud of that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Murmai, please stop sharing from your side. Thank you very much. Um, may I now call upon Dr. Harshada to present her paper? Please stop sharing, Munmai. Yes, Dr. Harshada. Dr. Harshada. Yeah. Fine. Share your screen. Uh, I'm happy all students are doing well. Our judges are too interactive and discussion sessions are going on. Uh, I am really uh, sorry for next two judges have been joined, but we are a bit late. Sorry for inconvenience. Uh, start, Harshida. Uh, Can you share screen, Harshada? Am I audible to you? Ma'am, there is no Harshada that I can see over here. There is one Harshita. No, Harshita is there. Just uh, she shared the screen and I think the connection has been lost. Uh, okay. Uh, now I would like to call our next uh, presenter, Mariam Sheikh. Is she there, Mariam Sheikh? Mariam? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
yeah please share your screen harshada you will share uh, you will uh, present at the end mariam please yes, start uh, just kindly note uh, she is mariam A very good morning to one and all present here. I, Dr. Madhyam Dilshar Shaikh, resident in Department of Ops and Gynae at Dr. D. Y. Patel Medical College, Pune. I am here to do a paper presentation. My topic is comparing the efficacy of clomiphene citrate and letrozole in treating infertility due to ovulatory dysfunction. Now, infertility is a disease of the male or female reproductive system defined by the failure to achieve a pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. Research in this area is important because infertility affects 60 to 80 million couples globally each year, with India accounting for 25 percent. According to WHO, infertility affects one out of every four couples in underdeveloped nations. Women experience the stigma associated with infertility far more than men. Facing familial disapproval, risk of abandonment, and gender-based violence within marriages in India. Now, causes of among causes of female infertility, ovulatory disorder constitutes forty percent, of which PCOS is the major component. Now, in ovulatory dysfunction, we have problem in the regulation of um, uh, reproductive hormones at the level of hypothalamus, pituitary gland, or problems in the ovary, which can cause ovulation disorder. WHO has classified ovulatory disorders in three groups. Group one is hypogonadotropic, hypogonadal A and ovulation. Group two is eugonadotropic, estrogenic and ovulation, and group three is hypergonadotropic and ovulation. Our study was conducted at Department of Ops and Gynae and Dr. D. Y. Patel Pune over a period of 18 months, from July 2019 to May 2021. Our objectives were to analyze the patient of an ovulation as a cause of infertility and to compare the efficacy of clomiphene citrate and letrozole in treating infertility due to ovulatory dysfunction. Now, uh, among for to in for doing ovulation induction, we have drugs. Clomiphene citrate was the first ovulation induction drug. It is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Clomiphene citrate's mode of action occurs at the level of hypothalamus, where it binds to the estrogen receptors and depletes their concentration. The hypothalamus interprets this estrogen receptor depletion as low circulating estrogen, on which on uh, um, causing change in the GnRH pulses, leading to increased FSH and LH levels in the blood, which induces follicular genesis and ovulation. Clomiphene citrate is generally well tolerated. Mood swings and hot flushes are common side effects. A multi-follicular development also occurs, causes multiple pregnancies, resulting in twin pregnancies. And in rare case, we have ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome has been also linked with clomiphene citrate treatment. Aromat among aromatase treat uh, inhibitors, uh, it was initially designed to reduce estrogen levels in breast cancer patients. In 2001, this drug was initially used to induce ovulation, mostly in patients with PCOS. It inhibits the aromatase enzyme complex cytochrome P450, lowering the estrogen levels in the blood, thereby creating a hypothalamic negative feedback, resulting in greater GnRH pulses, more FSH, causing ovaries to form follicles. Letrozole is the most widely used ovulation induction drug. It has a short life of 45 hours, and it can be removed from the system quickly. Now, aromatase inhibitors have a few. More benefits than clomiphene citrate since they do not deplete estrogen receptors and the usual negative feedback loop is intact. And also, when compared to clomiphene citrate, letrozole has a decreased risk of multiple pregnancies. Mater um, material and methods. Uh, it was an open-label comparative randomized clinical trial. Total of 60 patients with infertility diagnosed with ovulatory dysfunction were recruited. Patients were divided into two treatment groups based on computer-generated random numbers. Patient included aged for 18 to 20, 35 years with infertility diagnosed with ovulatory dysfunction, in whom all other causes of infertility were ruled out and were willing to give written informed consent. Treatment protocol uh, in the clomiphene citrate group: we administered the dose of 50 mg once daily from day two to day six, till and increased 50 mg per cycle till ovulation achieved to a maximum of 150 mg. And in the letrozole group, we gave 2.5 mg once daily for five days from day two. Day six, and then increased uh, 2.5 mg per cycle to a maximum of 7.5 mg in the following cycle. 
now our results were the mean age patients for the uh, letrozole group was 29.8 years and for the promethine citrate group was 31.4 years uh, we uh, among the results we saw that ovulation occurred in 83% of letrozole group patients which was a significantly higher as compared to a promethine citrate group which was only 63% the number of follicles were more in the uh, clomiphene citrate group which was 1. Point, one, min one minute is remaining uh, 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 the number of follicles were more in the uh, letro uh, clomiphene citrate group as compared to the letrozole group the et thickness were more in the was more in the letrozole group as compared to the clomiphene citrate group and in pregnancy uh, we saw the conception weight was 63% in the letrozole group as compared to clomiphene citrate which was 47% and the adverse drug reaction was compared. Now we conclude that based on our results that ovulation rate in endometrial thickness and pregnancy rate was found to be significantly higher among patients in letrozole group. The mean number of follicles was lower in the letrozole group. Side effect profile was similar in letrozole group and group receiving clomiphene citrate. Now aromatase inhibitors are a novel class of medication that has recently been added to the reproductive therapy. They can be taken orally, affordable, and just with mild side effects. Our findings show that individuals treated with letrozole had a better clinical outcome than those treated with clomiphene citrate, which has a comparable adverse effect profile. Therefore, we recommend letrozole can be used instead of clomiphene citrate as a first-line therapy for PCOS in women. To back up our findings, more multi-centric, randomized, double-blinded clinical studies. Any questions from Dr. Kiran or Dr. Nalini, ma'am? Dr. Kiran, sir, or Dr. Nalini, ma'am? Any questions? Did he get any patients with hyperstimulation? Oh, no, sir. We didn't find any patient of hyperstimulation. It was just like in the uh, like studies, different studies, we found that there was one or two cases which was seen uh, with this uh, drug. Can we move ahead, sir, ma'am? Yes, yes, we can proceed. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, please uh, stop sharing, uh, sharing, Mariam. Yes. Now, I would like to call Dr. Harshada. Dr. Harshada. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please share your screen. Very good morning, dear respected judges, doctors, fellow doctors. I'm Dr. Harshda. Today, I'm going to present a study of serum thyroid hormone and prolactin uh, levels in infertility. The causes of infertility can be due to female factors, male factors, combined factors, or unexplained. Under female factors, the important causes of infertility include, include hormonal conditions such as thyroid problems, diabetes, hyperprolactinemia, polycystic ovary syndrome. Thyroid dysfunction is a prevalent uh, in female population and is known to affect reproductive function and even pregnancy. Thyroid hormones, that is T3, T4, are responsible for the normal growth, sexual development, and reproductive physiology. Hyperprolactinemia causes infertility by primarily affecting the ovulation. Furthermore, hypothyroidism is often associated with increased prolactin levels, which leads to delay in LH response and abnormal ovulation. Uh, so this was a prospective study conducted at Nandadi Hospital Research Center and Yash IVF Center over a period of one year from March 2021 to February 2022. Informed and written consent of all participants was taken and the study was approved by Institutional Ethical Committee. The aim of the study was to evaluate and compare the status of thyroid stimulating hormone and serum prolactin in the age match in fertile females with normal fertile females in Satara region of Maharashtra and to find out any correlation between TSH and prolactin in cases of infertility. So the inclusion criteria that we obtained was for the selection of the study cases for diagnosis of infertility, both primary and sec secondary, age between 20 to 40 years. The exclusion criteria that were adopted during the case selection were male factor infertility and um, amongst female factors were tubal factor and congenital anomaly of urogenital tract, any obvious organic lesion. Any history of thyroid disease or previous thyroid surgery or being on medication for thyroid disorders or hyperprolactinemia was also amounted to exclusion for the study. Uh, so, thyroid profile analysis of serum prolactin levels. Uh, thyroid, uh, sorry, the thyroid profile analysis for serum prolactin levels were uh, measured by fully automated chemilinescence immunosal analyzer, and so normal uh, reference ranges were opted. 
for the statistical data analysis descriptive statistics were used to show the characteristics of infertile and fem uh, fertile females means were compared using independent t tests psn or spearman correlation coefficient whichever was applicable has been used to see the correlation between infertility prolactin tsh levels a two tailed minimum at minimum 95% uh, confidence interval and p value the uh, present study includes 50 uh, subjects with infertile infertility infertility as case study and 30 age matched healthy fertile females as control group most of the patients were in the age group of 20 to 40 years so uh, that as you see the data uh, the table shows various uh, values of tsh t4 t3 and prolactin levels in infertile and control group uh, in which we can see the t4 levels are increased uh, uh, more than the control group in infertile group and the th while the tsh t3 and prolactin levels are increased but not that statist uh, statistically in, uh, significant so the hyperprolactinemia affects all age groups in our study and the pie chart shows the uh, percentage prevalence of hyperprolactinemia status in both types of infertility among test groups so uh, which can which we can see it, it affects more in secondary infertility uh, however, this table summarizes the uh, percentage prevalence of thyroid status in infertile subjects, which, in which we can see most of the subjects in our study were youth thyroid and followed by 14% subjects which were hyperthyroid. The correlation between two variables, TSH and prolactin levels, uh, was uh, calculated by uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient was calculated for serum TSH and prolactin. Menstrual pattern was see, uh, was also amounted uh, in fertile patients in which we can see 16 and patients that, that is 32 percent of our uh, case study were having irregular menses followed by oligomeric uh, patients which were four patients duration of infertility in our uh, in years of female infertility in patients were calculated and the table shows the same uh, the duration ranged from two, 2 to 13 years and the maximum patients were seen in the duration from the uh, in the duration it range from five to seven years. The correlation for plot of thyroid stimulating hormone against prolactin in the controls uh, it was plot which shows positive correlation. Hypothyroidism is associated with increased production of TRH which stimulates pituitary to secrete TSH and prolactin. Hyperprolactinemia adversely affects fertility potential by impairing GnRH fertility and thereby ovarian function. Therefore, in every infertile female should be uh, investigated for TSH and prolactin levels regardless of their menstrual rhythm at the time of initial consultation. Thyroid dysfunction was reported to reduce the likelihood of conception and may affect pregnancy outcome. Prevalence rate of women with both hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia increased throughout the screening period. I also compared the uh, my study with other studies like Vidal et al. and Gosami et al. who stated uh, that hypothyroidism is commonly associated with hyperprolactinemia result in ovarian failure. Hence, assessment of serum TSH and prolactin levels are mandatory in the work of infertile women, especially with those with menstrual irregularities. Uh, so hyperprolactinemia affects, uh, as, I, as I said, hyperprolactinemia affects all the uh, age groups in our study, which is more common in primary infertility. That is 13 out of 17 patients showed uh, 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 hyperprolactinemia. Significant positive correlation was found between TSH and TI, uh, prolactin, which was also found by Craver and four workers. So in the uh, study, there is moderate prevalence of hypothyroidism in infertile females. These disorders may lead to menstrual irregularities resulting in infertility. This is also associated with hyperprolactinemia and these patients are commonly associated with ovar ovulatory failure. Hence, the assessment of serum TSH and prolactin levels are mandatory in the work of, of uh, infertile women, especially those presenting with menstrual irregularities. Since a significant correlation exists between serum TSH and prolactin levels in infertile females with irregular menstrual cycle, for the studies with a large sample size and long follow-up uh, that are necessary to validate the variation of TSH and prolactin levels. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Harshadan. Uh, can we have questions? Dr. Kiran sir, Dr. Nalini ma'am. We are really uh, running short of time. Uh, one minute discussion. Yes, uh, Harshadan. If there is yes, uh, hypothyroidism and hyperprolactinemia, then yes, uh, how you treat that patient? Uh, Ma'am, um, I will. Uh, I will. I would like to start the patient on uh, thyroid medication, thyro uh, like thyro uh, thyronome, and yes. I will. Uh, I would like to treat the hyperprolactinemia also, Ma'am. Uh, like cabergoline, the cabergoline has showed uh, 
nice results as i have studied on other studies ma'am uh, see you have correlated this hyper hyper yeah, thyroid hypothyroidism with the hyperprolactinemia yes, you can give yes, this uh, 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 thyroid hormone means uh, yes, uh, thyronorm you can give yes, and at the same time you can monitor after one month the uh, hyper this uh, prolactin level also even if you yes, correct sir. this uh, hypothyroidism your prolactin level yes, will come normal yes, so in all yes, cases you should not give it no yes yes that was your conclusion yes isn't it ha huh, yeah yes, very well uh, it is nice paper ha huh? yeah yes thank you okay uh, shall i uh, shall i call next participant which is a last and very small case uh, dr lalita uh, please stop sharing dr harshada dr lalita yes ma'am yeah please harshada please stop yes fine screen share beta very good morning to all the judges uh, i am dr lalita second year is your resident please in the hospital share your screen share your screen is it visible ma'am yeah fine A very good morning to all the judges. I'm Dr. Lalita from Nandiri Hospital. I'm here to present a case report regarding Asherman syndrome. A 28-year-old female patient, Para One Live One, with one history of abortion, who is married since seven years, presented to us with secondary infertility and hypomenorrhagic cycle since three years. Coming to menstrual history, she had regular painless and scanty menses since three years. Uh, past menstrual history, she had regular painless 28 to 30 day cycle with moderate flow. Her obstetric history, she had six years old male child uh, delivered through full term normal delivery alive and well, and she has uh, one past history of one abortion at eight weeks for which DNC was done three years back. Past history, patient has taken treatment for secondary infertility for about three years. Six cycles of ovulation induction with clomiphenicetate and letros was done, and three cycles of IUI was done. She had ovulatory cycles. Post ovulatory endometrium was 4.5 to 5 mm. Coming to medical and uh, surgical history, she uh, did not did not had any uh, significant medical and surgical history. All her biochemical uh, profile was within normal limits, uh, except for USJ, which showed uh, and. thin endometrium of about 3.2 mm in view of thin endometrium and secondary infertility patient was advised diagnostic as well as operative lab hysteroscopy on introducing hysteroscope external loss was visualized normally atresia of the internal ostium was noted which was released slowly and enter the uterine cavity which showed big band between the two uterine walls more than one third of the cavity found with filmy additions and for which additional lysis was done bilateral ostia were patent and no additions were noted except for endometrial tissue which was thin Endometrial tissue sample was collected and sent for HPV and TB PCR. Post procedure, police catheter number eight was kept intrauterine for eight days to prevent further intrauterine additions. A histopath examination was suggestive of normal endometrial tissue, and there was no growth for acid fast bacilli on TB PCR. This is American Fertility Society classification, which involves extent of cavity involved, type of additions, and menstrual pattern. For which we give prognostic classification from mild to severe. depending on prognostic score based on american fertility society classification of uh, intrauterine additions in our case more than one third of the cavity was involved score was given to uh, there were filmy additions score is 1 five hypomenorrhagic cycle score is 2 so total prognostic score was 5 coming to the results patient was kept on folic acid for fall following 3 months patient started having normal menstrual flow post procedure patient conceived spontaneously after 3 months and she delivered a healthy baby boy of 3.2 kg to normal vaginal delivery and her antenatal and postnatal period was uneventful coming to the review of the literature uh, it was a study conducted by kk roy et al the mean age of the patient was 28 Point four years in the majority, that is about sixty four percent of the patients, the possible cause of Asherman syndrome was previous curettage on gravid uterus. The overall conception rate was forty point four percent after hysteroscopic additional lysis. The mean conception time for surgery after surgery was twelve point eight months. There was no conception in patients who needed repeated uh, additional lysis. The conception rate was higher, that is fifty eight percent in mild Asherman syndrome compared to moderate and severe cases. 
there was no significant association between conception rate and pre-op uh, menstrual pattern. There was significant higher likelihood of conception rate, about 44.3% in those who continue to have improved menstrual pattern compared to only 10% likelihood of conception in those who continue to have amenorrhea after initialisis. So conclusion is hysteroscopic initialisis for Asherman syndrome is a safe and effective method of choice for restoring menstrual function and fertility. Coming to the discussion, Ashamans is an infrequently acquired uterine condition characterized by bands of fibrous. Only tissue. one minute, Lalita. Only one minute. Mostly after an iatrogenic pause. So these are the types based on the extent of the cavity involved. Coming to the causes, the main causes. Come, come to conclusion is, slide. Come to conclusion slide. slide. The summary of risk factor. The, mm, Miscarriage curettage accounts for about maximum percentage for Ashwans. Uh, so my conclusion is Ashman syndrome is a condition with a high impact on female reproduction. Even in women who conceive after Ashman's treatment, a scrupulous surveillance should be carried out for the high risk of placental anomalies and much effort should be devoted to the prevention. The introduction of hysteroscopy has significantly improved the fertility outcome and the treatment success rate. Nevertheless, Ashman syndrome recurrence rates remains high and we must continue to look for techniques which reduce the formation of new additions. Thank you. Thank you, Lalita. Uh, may I have questions from judges? Do these patients have any altered pregnancy outcome? Sir, can you repeat the question again, sir? Do these patients have any altered pregnancy outcome? Do they have any risk to pregnancy even if they conceive? Yes, sir. De depending on the severity, for moderate and severe cases, uh, pregnancy outcome was mostly uh, cesarean section or we have to go for IVF. Or there was placental uh, placentation anomaly. Earlier pregnancy, do they have any risk? Uh, earlier uh, with previous cesarean section, the conception rate was little lower. Fine. Have you done any color Doppler? Ma'am? Have you done any color Doppler before the hysteroscopy? Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. Hello. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Lalita. It's a wonderful uh, session. And uh, being so uh, nice judges, so nice discussion. I'm really happy for uh, for the judges. Uh, Piyush, I want to felicitate our both esteemed judges. Can you share? Yes. Uh, I would like to felicitate Dr. Nalini Bagul, ma'am. Ma'am is MD OBGY, Masters in Laparoscopy, Masters in Reproductive Medicine. Uh, if I read, I just uh, from the start. When I started the session, I told okay, if I read, I, I won't have the enough time to uh, say her thanks and uh, lots of uh, work she has done for uh, our womanhood. So uh, I will felicitate her. Piyush, please share the bouquet. Piyush? Yes, ma'am, please hold on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Piyush, I can't see here. I'm seeing. Okay, okay. Uh, now I would like to felicitate Dr. Kiran Patole, sir. Uh, sir is Professor and HOD, Maharashtra Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Nashik. Uh, and also, sir, is national convener for IMA Medical Education Committee. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, ma'am, uh, for being with us. And uh, please, Piyush, uh, felicitate, sir, with her online booking. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, and I must congratulate you for conducting this session so nicely and so neatly. 
thank you sir thank, thank you. you so much thank you sir uh now i would like to call upon dr ujwala bhamre ma'am and dr arun more sir for our next session of poster presentation uh both are dynamic in their work and uh, uh, i would like to call our first participant dr radhika joshi is she there yeah, yes ma'am i'm here uh, ujwala ma'am good morning very very good morning and i am really sorry uh, for the inconvenience and we are running bit late because of some technical issues uh, screen sharing time is going so really uh, sorry for uh, sorry for it ma'am Good morning to all of you. Good morning, Doctor uh, Arun sir has joined. Doctor yes. Arun sir, I am there. Okay, very good morning, sir. Very and good really, morning. Thank you very much for bearing us and uh, that half an hour you have adjusted both of you. Thank you, sir. Please start, yes. Doctor Radhika. Yes. Uh, good morning, judges. Uh, myself, Radhika Joshi. So share I'm your here. screen. Share your screen, beta. Yeah, I, I'm sharing. Okay. <clears throat> Visible. Yes. So uh, for today, it's not uh, visible. It's not visible. Okay. Oh, give me a moment, please. Uh, is it visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. So myself, Radhika Joshi. Uh, I'm presenting a poster today, and I have two slides. So kindly let me know when you finish reading the first slide, so I can change to the next one. You present it, Radhika. Doctor Radhika, you present it. We won't read it. Uh, okay. All okay. participants, please notice that it's a poster presentation, and it's online. Okay. so you talk about it for at least 5 minutes or 4 minutes it is okay and then you will have a question and answer session kindly note all participants because it's a less fun so we won't uh, read it you just present it okay okay so uh, briefly telling you about my project so uh, i did this project in national taiwan university and the uh, main focus of our project was we isolated this special protein called qsox1 c and the interesting part about this protein was that it is um, highly found highly expressed in the seminal vesicles so the concentration in the seminal vesicles is very high as compared to the other parts of the body so what we try to understand is what is the physiological role of this protein so we isolated this protein from mouse and we tried what is its effect on the uh, sperm physiology so we simply took the protein purified it and incubated with our sperms what we interestingly found is uh, that when we incubate proteins with this sperm the uh, the sperms suddenly aggregate maybe within 60 to 90 minutes majority of the sperms form aggregation so uh, when we try to analyze whether there is any special speciality about these aggregates or does this qsox protein aggregate certain type of sperm cells we uh, interestingly found that these sperm cells are usually apoptotic or they have a high or they are very oxidatively damaged they have a very high ros concentration and thirdly what we found is that these sperm cells show a very high concentration of free thiols so free thiols is a peculiarity of immature cells so um, these three things that is they are highly oxidatively damaged they are apoptotic and they show free thiols so that led to a conclusion that qsox 1c this protein can selectively aggregate damaged sperm cells as you can see in the picture of the results you can see a big aggregate of sperm cells and down below you can see we have used a, a, a special type of stainings to uh, study oxidative stress and free thiols uh, so all in all if we see the property of qsox 1c to aggregate the damaged sperm cells we think that it could be a potential marker to select healthy sperm cells before we use it for ivf or icsi so this was a very short uh, uh, pre oral presentation of my work 
if you want i can elaborate on certain points that you need uh, me to elaborate uh, i request dr ujwala and dr uh, arun sir uh, if there are uh, any questions please ask uh, is this technique uh, implemented in human being uh, no sir since uh, although we used uh, the the protein is isolated from mouse uh, seminal vesicle but all my uh, research all the for the research is done on human spermatozoa uh, although it's not in clinical use right now we are in a very initial stages of its uh, testing do you feel that it will be helpful definitely your uh, instinct my instinct is it definitely will be helpful sir will it increase the uh, result of ixc or ivf yes sir yes sir so basically you simply uh, take the semen sample put it with qsox1c and yeah. the sperms which are not aggregated you can uh, definitely use them with full confidence that they will be uh, healthy and non apoptotic or no less oxidatively damaged when was this study done in which year uh, sir this study began in 2016 and um, this uh, Uh, the results till now they are four four years of this study but uh, still now there might be some attempts uh, in human being at least uh, was this protein detected in uh, human uh, seminal fluid yes 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 sir yes sir okay in humans and also we tried to test the postcoital uh, function uh, like what this protein does inside the uterus so yeah. it, it still has the same function we saw a correlation that it still aggregates damaged sperms even intrauterine but uh, my question is if it is present naturally is there any need to add it uh, additionally uh, so, right sir uh, that that's a good point so there are two parts of this study so one yeah. is to know the natural role of qsox1 c and the second role is how can we use that function for our benefit so the natural role inside the male format inside the male physiology is uh, the sperms they usually aggregate when they are inside the uh, stored in the epididymis they aggregate so that they do not undergo spontaneous capacitation on acrosome yeah. reaction so maybe inside the physiological role qsox1 c helps the uh, sperms to stay together yeah and um, when even when they go inside the uterine cavity maybe it uh, helps to aggregate the damaged sperm so that all the healthy sperms can reach the oocyte and this function may and this particular function to our benefit we can use to select good spermatozoa okay thank you yes, thank is it, uh, radhika radhika is it possible to have this um, uh, q qsoc uh, made chemically because it is very difficult to extract from humans and this and use it for our daily use so is this possible to make it uh, in the lab Uh, right, ma'am. Uh, right, right, ma'am. So right now, um, uh, we isolated from mouse, and the good part is we do not need to sacrifice uh, many mice to have quant uh, uh, enough quantity of Qsox. But yes, chemically, it is. I think it will be possible to uh, make this protein uh, chemically because the the stuff is not very intricate. and the second question i wanted to ask you is we need to see whether once we add this it removes all the uh, oxidatively stressed uh, sperms okay but what it does to the remaining live sperms whether capacitation motility have have the study been done and what is the effect of them whether it's uh, uh, neutral or whether it adds i mean uh, increases the motility or decreases uh, any studies on that uh right ma'am so we uh, we studied a part of your question that what effect does it have on the does it affect the capacitation or the acrosome reaction status of the sperm cell and uh, what we found is that it uh, certainly inhibits capacitation so um, one one reason to this property is that because it is the sperms are present in the uh, stored in the epididymis so the it does the sperm should not undergo capacitation in the male reproductive tract so maybe it acts as a decapacitation factor inside the males so this is one notably a uh, thing but we need to take care of this uh, a particular factor if we want to use qsox as a sperm selection tool that it should not uh, capacitate the sperm yes thank you Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Dr. Radhika, uh, Dr. Ujwala, ma'am, and Dr. Arun sir. Uh, I would like to call our next participant, Dr. Mukda Vaje. Dr. Mukda Vaje, please share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Yes, ma'am. Hello. Yeah, you can start. We can see your screen. Uh, my topic for a poster presentation is different semen sample preparation techniques in intrauterine insemination. Introduction. Intrauterine insemination has been used for the treatment of infertility, often as first-line therapy. Its overall success varies with pregnancy rates per cycle ranging from 5 to 20 percent. The objective of this poster is to compare the advantages and disadvantages of different semen sample processing technique. My three, uh, uh, three uh, techniques are simple wash technique, swim up technique and density gradient separation technique. Simple wash technique, it is Simple, best for low volume, low count, low motility, and low debris samples. Only removal of plasma is done. No enhancement of motile sperm and no removal of cells like immotile sperms, cellular debris, or leukocytes. It is, it is a fast and inexpensive method. The advantages are it is easy to perform and time saving. Can be, it can be used to process semen with severe parameters. Disadvantages, uh, re reactive oxygen species generation and reduced spermatozoa fertilization ability. And it does not separate unwanted cells and immotile spermatozoa from the yield. The swim up technique, the sperms are selected on their motility and the capability to swim out of the seminal fluid and preferred in normozoospermia. The advantages are it is easy to perform cost effective usually recover of recover of a very clean fraction of highly motile spermatozoa disadvantages are it is restricted to ejaculates with high sperm count and motility low yield spermatozoa can be massively damaged by reactive oxygen species significant decrease of the percentage of normally chrom normally chromatin condensed spermatozoa the density gradient separation technique it yields a high concentration of motile sperm, relatively free of cellular debris and leukocyte contamination, usually done for viscous sample, samples with high debris and dead sperms or infected samples. Advantages are usually a clean fraction of highly motile spermatozoa is obtained. Spermatozoa from ejaculates with a very low sperm density can be separated a good yield is obtained. Leukocytes are eliminated to larger extent. Reactive oxygen species are significantly reduced. Disadvantages are it is time consuming. It is more expensive and potential risks of endotoxins is present. From, uh, from all these advantages and disadvantages and the process, we come to a conclusion that different techniques are used to prepare the spermatozoa for IUI, but the choice strongly depends on the quality of the sperm, that is the concentration, motility, and the morphology of the sperm. And no technique is superior to any other technique. The first, uh, first technique, simple wash technique, in that technique, there is uh, uh, the semen is uh, the semen is divided into two samples that is uh, in uh, in a quantity of 2 ml in which uh, equal amount of medium that is 2 ml of medium is added it is mixed and centrifuged at three, uh, 300 rpm for 10 minutes the supernatant is removed 
the pellet is suspended in one ml of medium again and centrifuged for, and centrifuged for uh, for five minutes in at three hundred rpm. This uh, this pellet is again uh, extracted and which is used for artificial insemination. The swim up technique in swim up technique. Uh, the semen is divided in one ml fractions with three ml of media, and uh, is tilted for, for uh, tilted at forty five degrees Celsius and incubated at thirty seven degrees Celsius for thirty to sixty minutes. After which, one ml of supernatant is removed, and two ml of media is again added to it, and then again centrifuged at three hundred rpm for ten minutes. After which, the remain uh, the uh, separated pellet. Is used for uh, used for artificial insemination. In the density gradient method, uh, the semen is divided into uh, the uh, there is a top layer and uh, and a, a lower layer of eighty percent and top layer of forty percent in which uh, different uh, different um, medium is added for density gradient, which is available uh, which is available in the market. For this. For uh, in top layer, four to six ml of media is added, and in the lower layer, eight ml of media, a uh, density gradient media, is added with isotonic sterile media. After this, uh, after this, it is uh, centrifuged, and one ml of each medium is uh, extracted uh, and added, uh, and then the lower medium, that is eighty eighty percent. Is added below the uh, only one minute is remaining. Yes, ma'am. This uh, and uh, and then again two ml of, uh, two ml one ml of semen in, is added above it. It is again centrifuged at three three uh, hundred rpm for five fifteen minutes, and the pellet is again suspended in five ml of medium, which is again centrifuged at two hundred rpm for ten minutes. The supernatant is removed. And five ml uh, new medium is added. After which the centrifugation is repeated, and the suspended and the uh, separated pellet is used for artificial insemination. It, the categories: the preferential use in simple wash technique is low volume uh, semen, that is oligospermia. In swim up technique, normospermia, and density gradient technique, teratospermia or necrospermia. The time required for simple wash technique is 10-15 minutes. Swim up technique 30 to 60 minutes, and density gradient one hour to one and a half hour. For uh, the reactive oxygen species, <clears throat> are not affected in simple wash technique. They are present. High amount of ROS causing sperm damage are seen in swim up technique, and no reactive oxygen species are seen in density gradient technique. The sperm quality acquired in simple wash technique. is unwanted cells are not separated in sample wash in swim up technique very clean hymotized sperms are recovered and in density gradient technique high uh, clean highly motile sperms are recovered thank you any questions uh, yes sir. can you combine two techniques in one patient Yes, Doctor Mukda. Yes, sir. Can you combine two techniques in a single semen sample? Yes, sir. Okay. If you don't know, say. Mukda, what he's trying to say is, could you use a swim up technique first so that you remove uh, that, and then use a density gradient so that the uh, uh, rea uh, oxidative reactive stress is reduced? Can we do that? This is what he's asking you. Can we do one after the other? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What Dr. Morey is asking you is, can you combine two things that in case in one of the the swim uh, the um, 
uh, CMAP technique causes reactive oxidative stress and the gradient does not cause it. So can we get the CMAP techniques, the good uh, uh, sperms and then put it in a density gradient and can you do one procedure after the other so that you uh, get the advantages of both of them? This is what he's asking me. Have you got the no, question, yes. Beta? If no, yes. then it, if no, then it's okay. <laughs> Fine. Thank yeah, you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I would like to call now Dr. Nikita Samantra for her presentation. Dr. Nikita. Yes, ma'am. Please stop sharing, uh, Beta. First, Mukda, please stop sharing. Nikita, please start. Share your screen and start. Uh, ma'am, is it visible? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Good afternoon, uh, ma'am, sir. My name is Nikita, and uh, today I'll be presenting a case report: abortions, an uninvited echo of embryo reduction. The aim of this uh, report was to draw attention to the occurrence of abortions post embryo reduction in IVF fetal pregnancy, which is a less common but pretty devastating complication. The materials and methods used, uh, it was a case of a 30-year-old primary gravida with 15 weeks by gestational age who presented to OPD with us, uh, to us with bleeding TV since 10 days associated with passage of clots. On eliciting history further, the patient was a case of IVF, treated, IVF conceived pregnancy after 11 years of married life. Reports show that at the 30-week scan, a triplet pregnancy was detected with a monochorionic pair overlying the os. The couple was explained the benefits and risks of embryo reduction versus expectant management, and they decided to go with embryo reduction and carry further only one embryo. After the procedure of embryo reduction, the cardiac activity of the remaining embryo was documented and uh, demonstrated. She complained of spotting since the procedure. Uh, now on presentation to us, she had tachycardia and was hypotensive. On PERAP examination, the uterus was about 18 to 20 weeks with no tenderness elicited. Her vaginum showed active bleeding. A scan was done in which thickened endometrium with products of conception were seen. Her HB rapidly dropped from 11.9 to 6.8 and the patient was explained about the pregnancy failure. Considering the hemodynamic instability and large size of the uterus as compared to gestational age, a decision for hysterotomy was taken. On table, there was considerable amount of blood loss and she was man uh, uh, there was considerable amount of blood loss and the products were removed along with the placenta. The patient was managed with oxytocin, methogen, blood and blood products. Patient was stabilized and shifted to recovery for observation. The discussion part of this is the abortion was attributed to the risk of miscarriage associated with embryo reduction with high risk factors like maternal BMI, triplets reduced to singleton, posterior placenta completely covering the internal os, and the reduction of the monochorionic pair, which was less approachable as it was lying the os. At the outset, an obstetrician must always respect the patient's autonomy regarding whether to continue or reduce a multifetal pregnancy. Only the patient and their family can weigh the personal importance of the medical, ethical, religious, and socioeconomic factors that affect them to determine the best course of action. The risks of perinatal mor morbidity and mortality increase with each additional embryo. The spontaneous loss of the entire pregnancy is 25% for quadruplets, 15% for triplets, and 8% for twins. They must be offered a non-directive counseling and appropriate resources, which include maternal fetal medicine specialists, neonatologists, mental health professionals, child development specialists, support groups, and clinicians with procedural expertise in multi-embryo multi pregnancy reduction. Uh, other uh, other in other uh, studies, in other studies also conclude that multifetal pregnancy should be prevented whenever possible. It is preferable to avoid the risk of higher order multifetal uh, pregnancy by limiting the number of embryos to be transferred or by cancelling a certain gonadotrophin cycle when the ovarian response is higher than expected. And this thus minimizes the need for embryo reduction further in the pregnancy. And this should be practiced by all physicians who treat women for infertility. In a woman with triplet pregnancy, embryo reduction increases the gestational uh, age at birth with three weeks as compared to ongoing triplets, which means it reduces the risk of preterm. However, there is no impact on neonatal survival, which is limited. Pregnancy outcome, fetal mortality and mortality in a, uh, in a triplet pregnancy after multi-fetal, uh, after multi-embryo reduction are directly correlated with the duration and amount of first trimester bleeding observed. 
Over the last 25 plus years, data from around the globe has shown that pregnancy outcomes are vastly improved by reducing the number of uh, embryos and multiples. But the most conservative of the commentators have long since accepted that the efficacy of uh, fetal reduction is more, but the issue then shifts to an ethical one which will never be universally accepted. So the argument from us is that from an autonomy and public health perspective that the embryo reduction needs to be seen as a necessary but hopefully increasingly rare procedure. The conclusion of this case report, the procedure of embryo reduction in an IVF fetal pregnancy can lead to abortions and in this case, life-threatening consequences of antipartum and postpartum hemorrhage in the background of hemodynamic instability. Even though it needs further study and consideration, embryo reduction must be seen as a necessary but hopefully rare procedure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nikita. Uh, can you have questions? Uh, Dr. Nikita, Nikita. I would like to ask you. Yes, sir. Uh, was uh, the bleeding, uh, what APH and PPH occurred, whether it was procedure related or it was related to placenta previa? Because you are trying to blame the uh, yes, sir. Of embryo that, reduction. Yes, sir. it was related to, so it was less approachable and covering mm -hmm. the OS. But sir, in most IVF treated pregnancies, they either go to trans abdominal route also. Yeah. So it was not necessary trans vaginal or cervical. So what I route was used in this patient? So she Sorry, sir. You have not mentioned which route was used for uh, embryo reduction. Yes, sir. Transabdominal. Transabdominal route was used. Okay. Yes. Nikita, I would like to ask you that uh, the embryo reduction was done at 13 weeks and she came with all these problems of bleeding at 20 weeks. So what according to you and the literature is the duration between the embryo reduction and loss of the remaining pregnancy. Do you attribute uh, seven weeks uh, no, 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 loss of pregnancy to this? No, ma'am. I meant to say the gestational age and the uterus size was not corresponding. The gestational size, uh, gestational age was 13 weeks, but because it was a triplet pregnancy, the remaining products like placenta and all attributed to more of the uterine size and maybe some RPOCs. That was oh, this my happened that... immediately following. Oh, oh, this followed immediately following the embryo. Yes, sir, 10 days. Yes, ma'am. I mentioned 10 oh, days. Okay. Okay. And you have not mentioned anything after the embryo reduction. You have not mentioned anything about the coagulation profile. Uh, yes, ma'am. She, uh, she presented to us with BV. Uh, like she, ma'am, the uh, procedure was done somewhere else and she presented to us with bleed. So, yeah, but did you do the coagulation profile? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But it was not during enough that we could not take her for OT. So. I have but one more question. CRP yes. was considered. What, what will be the medical legal implication of this? <laughs> that is to be discussed further. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Nikita. Now I would like to call Dr. Vandana Navani for uh, uh, next uh, poster. Dr. Vandana. Dr. Vandana is there? Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, please share your screen and better start. Yes, ma'am. One second, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I'm Dr. Vandana Navani. Uh, ma'am, I'm presenting a case of mirror syndrome, which is a rare obstetric disorder. Uh, mirror syndrome is also referred to as Valentine syndrome, triple edema, pseudodoxemia, as it is defined as the development of maternal edema in association with the fetal hydrops. Pathogenesis is not uh, well established and it may be misdiagnosed as preeclampsia, but it mimics trophoblastic damage and maternal vestibular endothelial dysfunction. Multiple etiologies causing severe hydropetalis, both immune and non-immune, have been associated with the development of mirror syndrome. It may be recess isomerization or fetal infections like parvovirus B19 infection, uh, bladder outlet obstruction, fetal anemia, cytomegalovirus infection, twin to twin transfusion uh, syndrome, placental choreangioma, and even sacrococcygeal teratoma. Syndrome is characterized by the fetal hydrops, placentomegaly with the maternal edema, hypertension, proteinuria, liver enzyme elevation, and sometimes headache and visual disturbances. Uh, 
I'm presenting a case of 20 year, 23 year old uh, woman with seven months of amenorrhea, which who came to Pravara Rural Hospital Loni with complaints of decreased fetal movements since six hours with complaints of swelling of hands and legs since five to six days. Patient was unbooked case, was illiterate, and she does not remember her last date of menstruation. Her first pregnancy has been uncomplicated, resulting in a term vaginal delivery. Her second pregnancy was preterm vaginal delivery with intrauterine death at seven months of amenorrhea without a known cause. Her third pregnancy was also preterm vaginal delivery with intrauterine death at eight months of amenorrhea. Patient gives history of taking NDD injection after first childbirth and took after subsequent deliveries, but no proof was available. Uh, patient was not a known case of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, or any thyroid disorder or cardiac illness, and she was of B negative blood group. Um, uh, on examination, on examination, uh, patient was looking ill with generalized edema. On admission, the pulse was 94 beats per minute. Blood pressure was 130 by 86 um, mmHg. Abdominal, pedal, and vulval edema were present. Proteinuria by urodipsic was found to be plus one. Cardiovascular and respiratory examination were found to be normal. On per abdomen examination, uterus was found to be of 32 week size, relaxed, syphilic presentation, longitudinal lie, and uh, fetal heart sound were not located on stethoscope. On per vaginal examination, the cervical os was one centimeter dilated, minimally effaced, membranes present, and station high up. Uh, ultrasound scan for fetal well being revealed a single live fetus with gross ascheitis, pleural effusion, and subcutaneous soft tissue edema, findings suggestive of hydrops fetalis with estimated fetal birth weight of 1.9 kg. Uh, and 27 week phyta gestational age. On admission, hemoglobin level was 8.5 gram, uh, gram per deciliter. PEC cell volume was 25%. Plated count was 2 lakh. Liver and renal function tests were under normal limits. Uh, patient was found to be indirect Coombs test positive for RH negative pregnancy. Subsequently, the labor was induced for termination of pregnancy. Patient delivered 1.6 kg male baby vaginally with placenta of 2,000 gram, suggestive of placentomegaly. Baby did not cry after delivery. Baby was tried to deacidate but did not make it. Maternal edema gradually improved following the delivery of the fetus. Patient had a speedy recovery and the patient was sent home 48 hours, uh, 48 hours after delivery. Uh, conclusion. Uh, an association between fetal hydrops and development of maternal edema in which the fetus mirrors the mother is attributed to mirror syndrome. Imbalance of androgenic and androgenic factor is suspected pathophysiology in mirror as well as in preeclampsia. But hemodilution is found in mirror syndrome rather than, he, uh, rather than hemoconcentration in preeclampsia. In most cases, uh, in most cases of um, mirror syndrome, the prompt delivery is indicated. But in individual uh, cases, in which the uh, uh, in, uh, like in the cases like of bladder outlet obstruction, uh, uh, hydrothorax, the successful fetal treatment has resulted in both uh, in uh, improvement of both fetal hydrops and maternal mirror syndrome. But if the maternal condition deteriorates in such conditions, the delivery is recommended. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please, questions from our uh, esteemed judges. Um, Dr. Arun, yes, sir. Vandana. Dr. Ujala, ma'am. Yes, Vandana, I would uh, like to ask you is uh, would you really treat uh, these patients before you deliver them because they are known to go downhill very fast so would you give them a chance of uh, like in the last conclusion you have said that you would uh, treat the fetus and wait because uh, the downhill uh, is very fast um uh, Ma'am, if the patient, uh, if the mother is uh, hemodynamically until until the mother is stable, we can try these uh, uh, conditions, ma'am. We can try these uh, res new resolutions, ma'am, now. Okay, and uh, because it's an endothelial dysfunction, do you think that uh, uh, e uh, Ecosprin or uh, Inoxaparin would be of any use here? Uh, we can use them, ma'am, uh, in, in high risk, all high risk pregnancies. If uh, previous pregnancies are known to be of RH negative, or uh, like uh, she had a history of previous two uh, IUDs, ma'am. So we can use in such patients. We can start with ecosprin, ma'am, in earlier in, uh, in earlier pregnancy only, earlier only. In the no, no, I'm talking if she develops mirror syndrome now. Hmm. Are you going to give any of this now, now? Not um, prophylactic. No, uh, no, okay. ma'am, because already the damage has started occurring, ma'am, now. Okay. okay, I will ask you one question. How will you proceed in next pregnancy if she is willing for further conception? 
मैं सर इफ वी विल एग्जाम वी विल कॉल पेशेंट फॉर रेगुलर फॉलोअप फ्रॉम स्टार्टिंग ओनली एंड इन सेवेंथ मंथ ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी विल विल एडवाइज आर आईसीटी टॉट टू डू द इंडायरेक्ट होम्स टेस्ट एंड इफ इट इज सिंस टू बी नेगेटिव व्हाट इज पर्पस ऑफ डूइंग आईसीटी नाउ शी इज ऑलरेडी आईसो इम्यूनाइज्ड ओके अम शी इज ऑलरेडी आईसो इम्यूनाइज्ड You said na ICT was positive. Positive, yes, sir. So she is already ICU immunized now. Will the status change over a period of time? Um, I, in the recurrence, just positive. How do we monitor a patient once she becomes ICT positive? What is further management? If she is not pregnant, if she is pregnant, we do with a color doctor and other things. But if she is not pregnant. How will you monitor her? Looking at her uh, cerebral uh, CP ratio or uh, the uh, fetal anemia on sonography? How will you? That's what he's trying to ask you. Will you monitor the fetal anemia because that's the ultimate effect, no? Of this before it before the baby goes into high drops, the baby will have anemia, right? Yes, ma'am. Because of destruction of RBCs. So what yes. do you see on what? How do you follow up this patient? How what do you see on sonography? um ma'am a uh, color doctor in no so you see a mixed systolic volume of yes we mixed cerebral artery no hmm? yes ma'am Mid middle cerebral artery fixed systolic volume you see no yes you can do the ict because that's only going to be positive right? that, that will okay. be during pregnancy in interconceptional period what will you do for her can you help her out okay let it be okay Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to call now Dr. Ashleesha Pawar for presenting her poster. Dr. Ashleesha. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashleesha Pawar. Mullerian duct anomaly is a congenital defect of the female genital system that arises from abnormal embryological development of the Mullerian duct. These abnormalities can include failure of development, fusion, canalization, or reabsorption, which normally occur between six and twenty-two weeks in utero. No sources estimate an incidence of these abnormalities to be from point five to five percent in the general population. It is generally accepted. That having a uterine anomaly is associated with poorer pregnancy outcomes, such as increased chances of spontaneous ab abortion, premature labor, cesarean delivery due to weak presentation, and decreased live births compared to normal uterus. However, the degree of these outcomes varies among uh, different types of uterine anomalies. In this case report, we discuss a rare case of diadyphous uterus. This patient is a 30-year-old female, P1, D1, A1, who came to our outpatient department with history of recurrent spontaneous abortions and preterm labor. Pelvic sonogram at that time showed a diagnosis of bicornuate versus diadyphous uterus. Histosalpingography confirmed diadyphous uterus. On examination, patient had a non-communicating thick vaginal septum. However, patient and husband were not aware of the patient condition until that day. There were no renal anomalies on subsequent abdominal CT scan. The patient did not report having dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, or chronic abdominal pain in the past. Patient presented in the uh, patient presented with positive pregnancy test after a few months. Patient was seen by a uh, maternal fetal medicine with suggestion for routine perinatal care. Patient had uncomplicated perinatal care and did not have any signs of bleeding. Cervical encephalus done at 14 weeks post NT scan and double marker test. Her labs and vital signs remained within normal limits and fetal ultrasound tracings also remained within normal limits. Fetus showed appropriate growth and the pregnancy was carried in the left uterus. At 34 weeks four days, the patient presented with sudden vaginal leakage of clear fluids with some bloody mucor discharge. On physical exam, she was not in any distress. Normal tensor and afebrile. Cross pooling of clear fluid was found on on specular exam, and the left cervix was one finger loose, fifty percent effaced on minus three station, with right cervix loose. The fetal heart showing a fetal heart rate of one fifty beats per minute. The bedside sonogram at that time showed the fetus to be what in uh, vertex position, placenta position anteriorly. Cervical so, stitch was removed. Thick was, uh, vaginal septum present. Hence, baby was delivered via cesarean section. 
in your bad obstetric history and was admitted in NIC. Most women who die. Idelphys are, uh, are asymptomatic in present with dysmenorrhea or dysmenorrhea in presence of in the presence of thick sometimes obstructing vaginal septum. The obstruction vaginal septum can lead to hematocolpus, hematometrocolpus, and thus presents as chronic abdominal pain as well. Rarely, genital neoplasm and endometriosis are reported in association with case of diadelphus uterus. The fertility of women with untreated diadelphus uterus has been shown by some sources to be better than those with other malarian duct abnormalities, but less than the women with normal uterine anatomy. There is also increased risk of spontaneous abortion, fetal growth retardation, and prematurity with an estimated 45% chance of carrying a pregnancy to term in comparison to a normal uterus, which is similar to the unicornoid uterus. This indicates poor reproductive performance, but still not as poor as septate or bicornuate uterus. Conclusion, the uterus, the diadelphus uterus is a uh, very rare uh, mullerian duct anomaly with varying reproductive and gestational outcomes in comparison to other more common abnormalities. The ability to conceive remains a debatable issue as well. There is insufficient data on surgical correction, therefore it is not usually indicated. However, excision of the vaginal septum may be required if the woman is symptomatic. Diadelphus uterus is not an indication for cesarean delivery unless the vaginal septum is thick and inelastic, resulting in increased risk for vaginal dystocia. Cervical incompetence has been shown to occur in conjunction with the diadelphus uterus. Thank you. Thank you, Ashlesha. Uh, can we have questions? Um. Yes, yeah. I would like to ask her that in in your conclusion also you have mentioned that uh, the cervical incompetence is more with the bicornuate uterus than with diadelphus uterus. So why did you do a cervical cerclage at 14 weeks when what was it? It was documented that the internal loss is open or the cervix is less. Uh, than during a second trimester, she had a uh, uh, one finger opening in the cervix, so it was indicated for cervical. Uh, and circulars as she had recurrent uh, abortions and freedom labors in her previous pregnancies. So it was not done prophylactically, it was done because the heart was opening. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Okay, I have a question. You have mentioned in your discussion that the chances of a pregnancy are uh, pregnancy outcome are better in diadelphus than other mullerian anomalies. Why so? Sir, as in uh, septate uh, in septate anomalies, there is a septum which can cause um, uh, more recurrent abortions and preterm labors. And in uh, unicornuate also, uh, there is um, more chances of preterm than diadelphus. As diadelphus has two u uh, uteruses, so uh, which can support a pregnancy better than unicornuate. Or, or uh, is there something to do with placentation? What is the septum made up of usually? Is it a myometrial tissue only or fibrous tissue? The fibrous tissue. Maximally, it is of fibrous tissue, especially lower part. So, placentation is poor and that's why you get the poor results in this. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shrikala, uh, I would like to call now Dr. Kanchan Kakade for presenting poster. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ashley, uh, Ashley, please Ashley. stop your sh screen sharing first. Yes. Dr. Kanchan Kakade, please share your screen now. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, fine. Start better. Uh, 
uh, I'm presenting a case on cervical fibroid. Leomyoma leomyomas are the most common benign tumor of the uterus. Growth of leomyoma is estrogen dependent uh, during reproductive years and gradually regresses after menopause. Cervical fibroid are rare and uh, account for 2% of all the fibroids. They arise either from the supravaginal and vaginal portion of the cervix. They are classified as anterior, posterior, central and lateral depending on their uh, site of origins. The symptoms are most commonly presented are retention of urine, menstrual abnormalities, constipation and sometimes can be present only as an abdominal mass without any or other symptoms. They mimic the ovarian tumors. Uh, a case report, a previously healthy 20-year-old female present to the, presented to the gynecological clinic with gradual abdominal distension for six months associated with progressive abdominal discomfort. There was no history of nausea, omitting weight loss or anorexia. She reported no changes in uh, bowel habits and denied uh, genitourinary symptoms. Minaj uh, occurred at the age of 14 years and her menstrual periods had always been regular. She denied recent sexual activities and not currently taking any oral contraceptives. The remainder of the patient's history, including a uh, focused family history and uh, non contributory factors are taken. On examination, uh, patient's vital are stable per abdomen examination. Physical examination revealed that presence of uh, somewhat uh, firm, irregular, non-tender and mobile mass arising from the pelvis corresponding to the size of pregnant uterus up to 20 weeks of gestation. Laboratory analysis showed that blood hemoglobin concentration of 9 gram per deciliter. The remainder of her laboratory uh, result were within the normal physiological parameters and pregnancy was excluded. On ultrasonography, abdominal <coughs> Abdominal uh, pelvis, uh, transabdominal ultrasonography revealed a uh, bilopicogenic uh, solid mass seen in pelvis uh, extending up to umbilicus and measuring about 16 into 15 into 8 centimeter. The ovaries and uh, adenexa were not visualized because they were uh, obscured by the enlarged bulky uterus. Neither ascites nor hydronephrosis was uh, noted. Patient was uh, advised MRI co correlation. On MRI, plain contrast, there was 12 into 13 into 16.6 centimeters size, large, well defined, heterogeneously enhancing abdominal pelvic mass is seen, arising from the right posterior lateral wall of the uterus, with multiple enhancing areas noted on the post contrast study, suggestive of posterior lateral subserosal degenerative uterine fibroid. The patient was counseled about the diagnosis of the uterine fibroid and underwent the exploratory laparotomy. The uterus was grossly, uh, intraoperatively, the uterus was grossly enlarged by the large fibroid measuring up to 12 into 15 into 15 centimeter. Uh, it is observed that both ovaries and fallopian tubes were normal. The uterus was elevated out of the abdominal cavity and myomectomy of large tumor was achieved. The excision of the site uh, was closed in with a continuous suture and abdomen was closed in layer. Cut section of the gross specimen revealed that whitish nodule of the fold appearance and fibroelastic consistency suggest you of benign leomyoma. The specimen was sent for the formal histopathology. Result of histopathological examination confirmed the diagnosis of the benign fibroid of the uterus. Postoperatively, the patient <coughs> uh, course was uneventful and she was discharged postoperative day four. Uh, a six-month follow-up with a recent ultrasonography was arranged. Counseling regarding recurrence and the future fertility was offered before discharge. The treatment algorithm of all the uterine leomyomas depends upon the patient age, early planning goals, as well as tumor size and symptomatology. Asymptomatic leomyomas can be kept under observation with regular evaluation to eliminate the possibility of malignant transformation. There are no treatment guidelines for symptomatic fibroids in adults. Uh, just wait, beta. Other participants, please unmute your uh, connectivity because someone is presenting their paper. Please unmute. Start, beta. Okay. There are no treatment guidelines for symptomatic fibroids in adolescents. Surgical treatments such as myomectomy, myolysis, and hysterectomy can be employed. Which uh, when appropriate, myomectomy is a common procedure performed for young women with symptomatic leomyomas. It prevents fertility and does not interfere with the hormonal of developing adolescents and associated with a low recurrence rate. Hysterectomy is often performed for the women with symptomatic leomyomas who do not desire to retain the fertility. Medical treatment and minimally invasive procedure can be performed in some cases to follow more rapid recovery. In adolescents, lack support, lack of supportive evidence, and little is known as 
powder hello yeah have you finished yes ma'am uh, sir please any questions ma'am any questions okay i'll ask one question if uh, there is a cervical fibroid how will you prevent uh, urethral injury while operating these patients you are not audible hello hello dr kanchan yes sir did you get my question no sir if you are operating this patient for minor cervical fibroid there is a chance of urethral injury so how will what precautions will you take to prevent this urethral injury yes sir there are chances of the injury but uh... yeah. thank you sir uh what i would like to ask uh, kanchan is that uh, um, how would you make sure i mean you would take the specific uh, action to uh, prevent urethric injuries by either doing a uh, urethric stent pre operatively but if you are not diagnosed this as a case of cervical fibroid then you are not going to do it so it's going to be a surprise so in such huge fibroids which are in the lower part of the uterus and according to your mri also this is just showing that it is a bulky uterus and coming from the uterus so you have no idea this is coming and this just this just does happen that uh, huge cervical fibroids when they are very large on mri they are not seen as cervical fibroids but part of the uh, uterine fibroids and the broad ligament fibroids so how would you ensure that this is a cervical fibroid what would you do any idea sorry ma'am okay uh, what you could do is since she is having this in 6 months she must have gone to some other gynae see the previous reports in that the, when the fibroid is very small i found it in practice that if the fibroid is very small it is mentioned as a cervical fibroid at this point of time when it is about 16 cm you don't know where it is coming from so always yes, look at the previous reports they give you an idea yes okay. ma'am yes ma'am thank you thank you very much yes dr shikala please see okay yes yes uh, so next participant uh, dr shweta kadam uh, she is presenting case on uh, renal tract malformation so dr shweta kadam please start your presentation hello good morning everyone am i audible Uh, just wait beta dr ashlesha pawar kindly mute yourself uh, you are disturbing others hello ma'am i am presenting on uh, ashlesha screen hello. but then there is a noise please make sure that because we are not hearing properly and there is some background music so please uh, try uh, to uh, get out out of that okay so, anyways you uh, start you uh, you continue dr shweta kadam good morning everyone uh, i am dr shweta kadam i am going to uh, present my case report on mulerian duct anomalies associated with renal tract malform malformation please carry your screen still the case is of dr uh, kanchan kakde just a second sir is it visible sir hello yeah yeah good morning again uh, i am going to present my case on mullerian duct anomalies associated with renal tract malformations uh, uniconvoid uterus is an infrequent type of mullerian anomaly which is due to failure of development of mullerian tract it represents 6.3% of the congenital uterine anomalies female reproductive system originates from mullerian ducts which during embryogenesis fuses to form uterine tubes uterus and upper two third of vagina if one of the ducts does not develop it leads to unicornoid uterus which has a single cervix and vagina uterus unicornis unicolae vagina simplex associated defects may be seen in the renal system due to close embryological interaction 
about 40% of the patients with uniconvoid uterus have urinary tract anomalies, usually of kidney. Uh, today, I'm going to present this case of a 24 years old young female with history of one li uh, live child by cesarean section and currently having amenorrhea of, for a period of nine months, presented to the labor room with complaints of abdomen, pain in abdomen. After meticulous history, clinical examination and imaging modality, it was noted that her previous transvaginal ultrasound and intravenous pilography reports were suggestive of uniconvoid uterus with contralateral renal agenesis. The patient went, underwent an emergency cesarean section uh, in view of breech presentation and delivered a healthy male child weighing 2.8 kg. The patient was vitally stable even during the entire procedure. The mother and the baby were discharged after stitch removal. So the discussion of this case report goes, incidence of Mullerian anomaly in reproductive age group is 3 to 5% and 5 to 10% in recurrent miscarriages. Uniconvoid uterus has significant problems with reproductive outcome, secondary to abnormal uterine vasculature and decreased muscle mass. Classification based on degree of failure of normal development of female genital tract was proposed in 1979 by Butram and Gibbons and modified in 1988 by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. According to this classification, there are seven classes. Uh, Class 1 is hypoplasia or agenesis, class 2 is unicornoid, class 3 diadelphus, class 4 bicornoid, class 5 septate, class 6 arcuate, and class 7 is diethyl stilbestrol drug related. So according to my case, the classification uh, unicornoid uterus represents class 2. There are four subtypes of this anomaly. Uh, they are as follows, communicating with communicating horn, with non-communicating horn, horn without cavity, and uniconvoid uterus without horn. So my case was without the horn, and urinary tract anomalies occur frequently in association with all the types of uterine anomalies. Uniconvoid uterus is caused by complete agenesis of all the organs derived from one urogenital ridge, resulting in uniconvoid uterus, and on contralateral side, no uterine horn and renal agenesis. So my conclusion is, I presented a rare clinical condition that demonstrate unicornoid uterus with renal agenesis concomitantly. Unicornoid uterus with absence of one kidney may be explained by the abnormal development of organs derived from the urogenital ridge. Thank you so much. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Please have questions. Hello. We can have questions. Uh, Shweta, I would like to ask you, are we using the American uh, classification or are we using the Ashley classification now um, for uterine defects? Uh, Ma'am, the second one, but uh, according to the American yeah, society yeah, is uh, what the seven types are. No, but we are nowadays using the Ashley classification. So yes, yes ma'am. Be better if you would have... Uh, okay, ma'am, okay. Okay, I have a question. What technical difficulties one can face while during cesarean section of uh, uterine anomalies? Uh, there can be delayed placental separation, sir. Yeah. I'm talking about during cesarean section. What difficulties one can face? Delayed placental, uh, okay, placental separation is one. Anything else? Abnormal location of the placenta, then... Uh, uh, the if there's a rudimentary horn or uh, malpresentation of the fetus is also there. Uh, yes. Like in my case, it was breech presentation. Okay. The uh, baby can be transverse. Yeah. What about bladder separation when you separate? An uh, extension of incision. The because lower segment is uh, usually not properly formed, sir, as uh, most of yeah. them will be preterm. Mm -hmm. So there will be a difficulty in separate uh, while separating the bladder, sir, bladder dissection. Okay. Okay. What is the what is the association of unicornate uterus with uh, infertility? Infertility, ma'am. Hello. Mm -hmm. how, how much percentage of unicornates are infertile? 
thank you thank you sir thank you ma'am uh, i would like to uh, so much call p harshita harshita this is the last poster of our session dr harshita Hello. yes ma'am i'm here good please morning please share your screen please share your screen i think the other person needs to stop sharing uh shweta please stop sh uh, screen sharing dr shweta okay now you uh, share your screen harshita yes ma'am good morning ma'am and sir uh i'd like to present a case about a successful embryo transfer in a patient with complete fine septal resection am i audible yes yes you please start yeah uh, so uterine anomalies can lead to infertility and problems among reproductive age women a lot of uterine malformations like septate uterus uniconvoid uterus and biconvoid uterus results from abnormal development of the paramesonephric duct fusion during the uterine development uh, in the, in the fetal stage the prevalence of uterine anomalies in the general population is about 0.5% septate uterus is the most common uterine malformation that is noted uh, along with anat anatomical factors there are various other factors like ovarian incompetency unfavorable endometrial lining tubal causes human semen husband semen discrepancies that can cause failure of conception if not treated before or taken care of parallelly uh, in our case it is noted that the patient was unable to conceive with only a septal resection uh, when it was augmented with a favorable endometrial lining a successful frozen embryo transfer a patient was able to conceive and also carry the pregnancy uh, so a 29 year old nali gravida uh present to our opd in dy patel college pimpri uh she had a married life of 6 years and was anxious to conceive since 4 years the patient had regular menstrual cycles and uh, no complaints about that her obstetric history she was married for about 6 years uh she previously underwent infertility treatment in a different setup uh, where that doctor suggested ovulation induction to her as well as iui cycles but they failed she had done around 7 iui cycles 4 years back after that she underwent a vhl uh in the vhl it was noted that the patient had bilateral pcod pcos as well as a septum in her uterus that was a complete septum extending from the fundus to the cervix uh during that procedure uh, septoplasty was done but a small remnant was left behind at the fundus as well as the cervical end and ovarian drilling was also done after that patient was still unable to conceive uh, then she came to us and uh, we and we and she underwent treatment here she had no other significant past personal or family history husband semen analysis was normal and husband had no comorbidities or any other significant history on examination patient was vitally stable her pulse was 90 per minute bp was 110 by 80 she had no pallor icterus cyanosis clubbing or lymphedema perap soft non tender uh, when her pus speculum examination was done her vagina was healthy but her so external os of the cervix there were two external openings noted there was no bleed or no discharge 
On per vaginal examination, uterine size was normal and bilateral for nices were free and non tender. No bleeding or discharge was noted. So, plan of action the patient was again put on ovulation induction. And if that failed, she was un she, un uh, she was uh, underwent IUI. We had tried two cycles of IUI, but still there was failure of conception. So then embryo transfer was decided after uh, residual section, uh, septal resection. Uh, so patients, uh, all routine was sent, which was normal. Her AMH was about 6.27. Her anterior follicle count was about 12 to 14 in each ovary. So before her septal resection, uh, we planned on a, uh, ovum pickup. Uh, ovum pickup was done and uh, with proper follicular monitoring. And on day three, the pickup was done and the ovum was frozen for further management. Uh, then after that, patient was advised one month bed rest. Endometrial lining was prepared and our embryos were prepared in the lab. Uh, sperm was uh, take, uh, sperm was taken by uh, uh, sp from the husband, and within four to six hours of retrieval, embryo uh, was made, and it was examined for about six to eighteen, sixteen to eighteen hours. Uh, then on the day twelve of her cycle, after the uterine line, embryo endometrial lining was prepared, uh, three embryos were transferred, and uh, beta HCG levels were monitored, and USG TVS was done. And it was noted that a single live intrauterine gestation of 5.5 weeks was noted. Uh, conclusion, the finding of a septate uterus per se is not an indication for surgical intervention because it is not always associated with poor obstetric performance. However, when a septate uterus is found in association with adverse re reproductive outcome, surgical intervention ought to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Harshita. Can we have questions? Yes, ma'am. Harshita, Doctor? where was the Harshita, where was the um, uh, pregnancy implanted fundus or uh, anterior wall, posterior wall? Where was it? Ma'am, the fundus actually we had done a partial. Uh, the partial uh, yes. section we had removed yes. a bit of, uh, but some of it we had left behind, as seen in the picture yes. here. Because we don't want uh, yes. perforation, so yes. it was done in the anterior yes. wall, and so even the sub on the anterior wall. Anterior wall, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, I have a okay. question. Whether the cervical part of septum, which was left behind, was also removed? Uh, so actually, sir, uh, we were anyway planning on an embryo transfer, mm -hmm. and if we have to do the transfer, then we have to remove the cervical part as well. Otherwise, it will be difficult to implant. So what we decided was we will remove the cervical part as well and then later perform an os tightening. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for a wonderful session, all participants. I thank our esteemed judges, Dr. Ujwala Bhamre, ma'am, and Dr. Arun More, sir. Piyush, can you allow me screen sharing? Yeah. Um, Dr. Arun More, sir. He is a deputy dean and professor and HOD of uh, OBGYN Dure. Sir is uh, sir is having special interest in rural obstetric and vaginal surgery. It's very uh, wonderful series, sir. Uh, Piyush, please uh, felicitate sir with the online visit. Okay, ma'am. Give me a moment. Yeah. Meantime, I thank Dr. Lard and the team for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We are blessed. The students are blessed to have you also. Thank you. Till the time, I also uh, uh, thank to uh, our esteemed judge, Dr. Ujwala Bhamdi, ma'am. Uh, she's practicing since almost 36 years uh, for womanhood. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I also request Piyush, please uh, hand, please felicitate ma'am also with her online bouquet. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you to you. organizers of Kurti Fest for giving me this opportunity. And Dr. Reshma, you've done a wonderful job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Now,
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Now we are having our third and last session for paper poster. I'm really uh, sorry for inc inconvenience for our uh, judges. I call upon uh, Dr. Anjali Patil, ma'am, Dr. Manisha Laddad, ma'am, and Dr. Amit Naik, sir, for uh, judging this session. I first call upon Dr. Ramya Chilakapalli for presenting her poster. Dr. Ramya. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. I'm here only. Yeah, please share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Two, two seconds. Um, Dr. Manisha, ma'am, Dr. Anjali, ma'am, and Dr. Amit, sir. Yes, I am. I am here, ma'am. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Dr. Manisha, ma'am, uh, also is there, uh, and Dr. Patil, ma'am, is also there. And I am really thankful to have you all. Uh, sir, we'll start the session. Ma'am, please start the session. Um, my poster is visible, no, ma'am? Yes, yes. Fine, better start. So my topic is harpoon in female pelvis, a rare case of Robert's uterus. And introducing this topic, pathologies of uterine cavities are a major cause of infertility and accounts to as many as 15% of couples seeking the treatment. However, congenital uterine anomalies occur only in 3-4% to of females. But what is Robert's uterus? Robert's uterus is a unique malformation described as a septate uterus with a non-communicating hemicavity consisting of a blind uterine horn, usually with unilateral hematometra, a contralateral unicornate uterine cavity, and a normally shaped uterine fundus. What is the my aim of the study? An incisive history and investigation protocol form the backbone of management of cases of primary infertility. Diagnostic laparoscopy and hysteroscopy are the gold standard in females with congenital anomalies of uterus. So a 33-year female, Nali Gravida, with married life nine years, came to our OPD with complaints of increased pain during menstruation since one year, and she is trying to conceive since five years. Her LMP is 25th October 2021, and LMP is 1st October 2021. Her present menstrual history since one year is three to four days uh, for every 24 to 28 days. There is less flow, uh, no clots, and there is increased dysmenorrhea. For now, she is using one pad per day. But her past menstrual history, before one year, one year, it was one to two days every month and uh, minimal or no flow, no clots, and she had dysmenorrhea. And uh, she used to have used no pads at that time and patient had similar cycles since her menarch. Obstetric history, she's married since nine years, nally gravida, and trying to conceive since five years. And she had taken only treatment for one year. Past history, she's a known case of hypertension since two years. She's on ta tablet, tell me kind AM OD. And also a known case of hypothyroidism since five years. And she's on tap thyronom, 50 MCG OD. On examination, she's widely, uh, vitally stable. And there are no signs of paler or uterus sinusis clubbing edema. For ab, for ab examination, we can feel a soft globular mass of eight into eight centimeters, uh, and uh, which is soft in consistency freely mobile and difficult in assessing the lower body, suggestive of pelvic origin, tenderness present over the left lower abdomen corresponding to the left margin of the abdominal mass. On perspiculum examination, cervix vagina healthy, no bleed and no discharge. And for vaginal examination, uterus is 16 week size, anti and bilateral fornices free and non-tender. Her lab investigations were pretty normal and by radiological investigations, and under USG abdo pelvis, there was a uh, uterus showed a non-communicating left horn compressing the rest of the uterus posteriorly. The endometrial thickness of the left horn is 18 mm and the right horn is 4.5 mm. Finding suggestive of left horn hematometra and query left-sided hydrosalpings or hematosalpings. Then we go for the next uh, gold standard investigation, the MRI, which shows uterus Bifid endometrial cavity, mostly like septate uterus with compressed and displaced right-sided endometrial cavity. A well-defined hemorrhagic collection in left endometrial cavity, 8.9 into 6.3 into 7 centimeters, which is likely hematometra, and a large side left-sided hematospalpings, halpings, mostly diameter 17 mm, and the cervix was normal. The management, we have planned a diagnostic laparoscopy and hysteroscopy for this patient and the hysteroscopic findings go as follows. Cervix and vagina are normal. Right-sided cavity visualized found to be small in size. Right ostia is normal. 
false passage or blind pouch found medial to the right uterine cavity separated by a septum septal resection was done and the lab findings were uterine fundus appear to be normal uh, dense adhesions are seen covering the right horn which were perihepatic mostly then these adhesiolysis were done left sided tube was dilated uh, then the left salpingectomy was done and a visible blood flowed out as soon as the salpingectomy was done the specimen sent for hpe and then the uterus opened from the left coronal end and the hematometra was completely drained and then the endometrium was cauterized using a bipolar cautery later on the uterus was closed with vicryl 10 round body as continuous interlocking sutures the discussion regarding of this case is the septate uterus results from a lack of septal resorption after successful mullerian fusion and robert's uterus is a rare type of mullerian duct anomalies and a variant of the septate uterus robert's uterus first described by robert in 1970 and is characterized by uterine septum dividing the endometrial cavity asymmetrically with non communicating hemi uterus due to obstruction by the septum as a result there is obstruction to menstrual flow in one cavity resulting in hematometra hematosalping and sometimes endometriosis so mri is the best modality to demonstrate this anomaly hysteroscopy in combination with laparoscopy is the gold standard for the diagnosis of robert's uterus the features include discordance due to laparoscopic appearance of normal uterine shape normal external funnel contour or slightly hollow protrusion with or without hematometra and hematosalping and hysterographic appearance of unicorniate uterus with only one ostium of the fallopian tube can uh, uh, can be seen the only effective treatment of robert's uterus is surgical operation via laparotomy and total horn resection or endectomy of blinded cavity and abdominal metroplasty or by combining histo and laparoscopy hysteroscopy and laparoscopy combined with ultrasound may be a better method for the diagnosis and treatment of robert's uterus this patient is currently is following up following with us with relieved dysmenorrhea and she is planned uh, for ovulation induction if not conceived naturally thank you ma'am okay uh, we will take questions now from the judges Okay, Ramya, you are presented. This is a case of uterine anomaly, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me what is the correlation of all these uterine anomalies in obstetrics? Why these anomalies are important in obstetric point of view? Uh, obstetric outcome differs differs from for a normal uterus and with an anomalous uterus, no, ma'am. An anomalous uterus has a varied uh, pl placental. Uh, uh, placement like it can be on a septum or whatever and there is uh, the presentation of the fetus can also vary uh, most commonly malformations are more common in uh, mullerian anomaly uh, uteruses so can you tell me which anomalies causes which uh, mal presentations uh Yes, ma'am. A uh, septate uterus most commonly causes breach and transverse uh, presentation, ma'am. And also, IUGR is more common in septate uterus patients. Uh, though arcuate uterus uh, doesn't have any effect, uh, doesn't have much effect on the fetus, and the uh, diadelphic uterus also had uh, has this. Uh, Effect on the fetus by having IUGR and all, ma'am. So in diadelphis, mostly there will not be any obstetrical bad outcome because most of the time there are good results. Only in septate uterus there are possibilities of malpresentation, as you say, breach or transverse. Okay. Okay. One one more query. Uh, uh, she was. Am I audible, ma'am? Am I yes, audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. She is thirty-three year old, and she is married for nine years. Yes. Sir. But could you explain the reason why this anomaly was diagnosed so late? Uh, sir, uh, she has come to our OPD like in this case. When she came to us, we have diagnosed her. But when she had also taken yes. infertility treatment in an outside hospital, so she has no uh, like. very uh, one to two flow one to two days flow but she had a regular cycle 
i think she didn't consider it as a big thing or whatever sir okay and on laparoscopy did you find any sign of endometriosis yes Because sir we have we found can... a sign of endometriosis like slight dots were there on the left side of the uterus uh here in my picture also they can be seen sir if possibly what can yes, be there the were signs of endometriosis ah, that can be seen what can be the reason for that sir the collected blood which can be going out from the left fallopian tube at the initial stages can be the reason for the endometriosis it doesn't flow from the left fallopian tube yes thank you i have a question, Any more question? can you hear me yes yes ma'am uh she is 33 years uh, married 9 years uh, back and then uh, what plans you have for the plans for her uh, conception so ma'am we operated this case in the late november ma'am uh, in the 19th of november was her state of operation and then she has followed with us uh, uh, in january she had uh, cycle her cycles were relieved it was for 3 to 4 days and she her dysmenorrhea was relieved ma'am uh, her husband semen analysis is done and it is pretty normal with the normal limits and then ma'am we are trying to, we are watching whether she will conceive uh, naturally for two months and if not we will plan with ovulation induction and uh, intrauterine insem insemination ma'am so uh, any more questions from the judges doctor she can call next one call next person um thank dr parth kunadia um, yes good thank morning you, everyone uh dr parth kunadia for his presentation dr parth yes. um good morning everyone i am dr parth like yes ma'am is my slide visible ma'am yes yes it is visible Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, esteemed judges. I am Dr. Parth Kunera from uh, Pravara Medical College, and today I will be talking about uh, spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in a young non-pregnant female. A uh, diagnostic dilemma. Uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is usually an androgenic disorder and associated with ovulation induction therapy with exogenous gonadotropin administration for in vitro fertilization. only few cases have been reported of spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome development without any conception or any therapy for ovulation induction in my uh, given case report i am describing the association of spontaneous over uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome with primary hypothyroidism in a young non pregnant female so uh, this female a 20 year old unmarried female presented with complaint of dull aching abdominal pain and vomiting since 15 to 20 days she is a known case of hypothyroidism since 10 years on tablet eltroxine but she is not compliant with the medication hormonal evaluation on admission revealed uh, decrease increased t3 t4 levels and uh, decreased tsh levels ultrasonography of pelvis showed grossly enlarged multicystic bilateral ovaries mri was done to confirm the ultrasound findings and it revealed bulky right ovary measuring 4.2 by 8 by 8.6 cm with 151 cc volume and bulky left ovary measuring 3.2 by 5.6 by 5.6 cm 54 cc volume uterus was normal in shape and size on mri findings to rule out uh, any ovarian carcinomas we did serum ca125 level but it was within normal limit based on all the investigations and imaging studies diagnosis of spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome was made endocrinologist opinion was taken and patient was counseled to be compliant with the thyroid medications she was follow, followed followed up after 3 months her symptoms were resolved repeat thyroid profile was normal and repeat ultrasound showed a markedly decrease in the size of the ovaries uh, so discussion part spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome due to hypothyroidism in non pregnant women is a rare clinical entity however ovarian malignancy is important differential diagnosis and needs to be excluded high index of suspicion and thorough investigations are required for definitive diagnosis of spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and to avoid unnecessary surgical interventions our case was managed conservatively by joint management of endocrinologist and gynecologist there was resolution in the cystic ovarian enlargement with appropriate treatment of the underlying cause as shown in our case with 3 months of proper continuation of thyroid hormone replacement therapy Have you done AMH in your case? 
no ma'am amh was not done in the case ma'am so on what basis basis you are telling that this is a case of ohss ma'am uh, the uh, patient uh, was uh, having uh, she is a known case of hypothyroidism but she was non compliant with the medications ma'am and uh, what are the okay and uh, ma'am on the clinical findings uh, all the rest of the uh, there was no uh, uterine anomaly which was visible on the ultrasound as well as the mri and the cystic ovaries were uh, found so based on the clinical suspicion ma'am we went for a serum uh, t3 t4 tsh level in spite of the medications they were uh, completely deranged ma'am on taking the history of the patient we came to know that she was not compliant with the uh, tab uh, this uh, tablets and then uh, endocrinologist opinion was also taken regarding the same because of the clinical suspicion of both the specialties we uh, started her on uh, we made her counsel regarding the compliance of antithyroid medications and then uh, decrease in the ovarian size was found so retrospectively we made a diagnosis that it was a case of spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome ma'am par excuse me uh, did you do study on levels then uh, yes ma'am ma'am uh yes ma'am estradiol levels were uh, high in her case ma'am what was the level because uh, there is a cut off level is it fit for e2 and whether she gave history of taking any other medication like ayurvedic or homeopathy because many times they go no no ma'am uh, she other was not on any medication she was only on a thyroid medication since 10 years ma'am but uh she did not she was not compliant with the medication ma'am no other medication history was given by the patient parth how about her menstrual history sir uh, she was complaining of uh, increase uh, decrease frequency of menstruation so the menstrual history was irregular but uh, she and she also complained of delayed menarche sir uh, she uh, told that the menarche started at around 17 to 18 years of age okay. what is the hallmark of diagnosing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome if you want to rule out ovarian tumor versus ovarian hyperstimulation which investigation would you like to sir as she is a uh, young female uh, we uh, to rule out uh, ovarian carcinoma we did ca125 level sir which were under the normal limit sir and she also did not have any other uh, clinical signs of ovarian carcinoma you know malay cactic say a loss of appetite or any such symptoms of clinical uh, this uh, clinical signs of malignancy but with that we rule out malignancy yes. to diagnose hyperstimulation you need to do serum estradiol levels yes sir then you can confirmly say that it is ovarian hyperstimulation yes yes fine thank you thanks uh, any more questions from the judges no thank you thank you thank you dr parth uh, i'll invite dr pragya choudhary for her presentation dr pragya are you there uh, uh, good evening everybody uh, ma'am am i audible yeah yes Yeah. Uh, my my topic is about an unusual case of macro perforated hymen del delivered spontaneously with hymenectomy surgery. Uh, introduction: Micro perforated hymen is a variant of obstructive hymenal membrane with a tiny opening which impairs vaginal intercourse and menstrual hygiene, uh, consequently impacting negatively the quality of life of a young woman. It is seen in one in two thousand female births. It is derived from in uh, incomplete degeneration of central portion of the hymen. This uh, case scenario describes the spontaneous delivery of a woman presenting with micro perforated hymen. This congenital condition can cause complications like hematocolpusis, hematometria, uh, and hematosalpings. And uh, even due to uh, retrograde menstruation, it can lead to uh, endometriosis. Uh, in rare cases leading to infertility issues the um, uh, case report a uh, 18 year old primary gravid of female with 9 months of amenorrhea came with complaints of pain abdomen and uterine contractions she was 39 weeks of gestation age without any previously diagnosed complications she had history of problems with sexual intercourse 
she also gave history of menstrual difficulties in childhood on uh, general examination secondary sexual characters were well developed on per abdominal examination uterus was uh, filled out with uh, fetal hormones were appreciated on per specular exa examination of the external genitalia <laughs> Dr. Pragya, we are, we are not able to hear you. Some audio problem is there. Dr. Pragya. Dr. Pragya. Can we just She's see just, off. yeah, she has lost connection, I think. Can we just uh, wait for just five seconds or uh, shall I call next participant? Anyone from her college is there? Anyone from her college is there? In audience, oh. yes, she has again joined. These are all technical issues when you are we are presenting it online. It just for the presenters also. <coughs> <laughs> Yes, Dr. Pagya, please uh, uh, start. Please start. You are not audible, Pagya. Uh, uh, hello? Yes, ah. ma'am. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. Please start. Okay. We are running short of time. Please start. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a crucial incision on the hymen was given under anesthesia and a healthy female baby of 2.5 kg was delivered vaginally. The cut edges of the incision were sutured and hemostasis was achieved. The patient was discharged on day five of the delivery with no uh, follow-ups. Imperforate, uh, imperforate hymen, uh, uh, imperforate and microperforated hymen, uh, hymenal tissue. They are uh, one second, ma'am. They are basically the embry uh, embryological development and a and a congenital disorder, which occur if genital tubercle fails to break down. The, these anatomical variants uh, include imperforate, septate, and cribriform uh, hymen. Microperforate hymen is the obstructive vaginal uh, membrane with a minimum income, uh, min minimal incomplete I'm obstructive pathology, usually permitting uh, menstrual flow. Uh, although a few reports show preg uh, pregnancies uh, related to hymen without uh, penetrative intercourse. The symptoms which characterize these malformations are yeah, primary yeah. amenorrhea, uh, pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding, uh, uh, PV discharge, dysuria, and infertility. Usually, these symptoms persist without an early intervention in uh, uh, in early pregnancies. Due to this, a simple microscope uh, microsurgery is proceeded. Uh, in the insertion of the hymen is recommended in uh, in early uh, pregnancies to relieve the symptoms. Uh, in culture, in cultures where there is a difficulty uh, in uh, like to conserve hymen, uh, where there is social and religious problems, it is important to conserve the annular structure of the gynecological practice. Failure to manage this correctly may have long-term sequelae, leading to psychological, sexual, and reproductive uh, health. The intact hymen. Only uh, one minute is remaining. The intact hymen by making a pinhole uh, opening uh, allows the passage of menstrual uh, blood flow and semen. Make, uh, may, uh, and even though there is difficulty in sexual intercourse, uh, they might uh, they might lead to uh, many changes like infertility and consequently the spontaneous pregnancy could occur. In conclusion, this case study we understand that minimum. Uh, 
then minimal hyaline causes problems in sexual intercourse may rarely lead to a spontaneous pregnancy and the uh, and if and cesarean section is a preferred choice in such patients but intervention with hymenectomy is a good option which indirectly affects the fertilization and improvement of sexual life thank you ma'am okay uh dr pragya was yes, this was this patient registered and booked at your hospital uh no sir she came as an unbooked patient in our uh, emergency duty okay suppose she was a booked case who would have come during her antenatal checkup what yes. would would have been your management the investigation sir what so, would have been your line of management uh so i would have uh, uh, so apart from seeing for the investigations like on examination i would also uh, suggest for no, the online uh, like uh, like all sampling of the blood test uh, beta like beta hcg levels and uh, estrogen levels uh, and also uh, i would uh, advise her transvaginal and uh, uh, and transabdominal sonography to find out of the any uh, uh, abnormalities of the hymen Okay. Or any treatment? Uh, imperforate hymen. Uh, the imperforate hymen will be uh, symptomatic treatment, sir. I would give the uh, like uh, NS NSAID, sir, for pain relief. Uh, and uh, and would sir, you, the main. Would you not have operated her antenatal? Ha, huh, sir. I I would have given her ex uh, like a hymen hymenectomy. I would have given like done a cruciate incision yeah. or anything which will uh, which will cause the men's the obstruction basically uh, to like to relieve the symptoms of like urinary symptoms or any irregular menses. Did you make any attempt to diagnose whether it is a imperforate hymen or a transverse vaginal septum? Yes. Uh, um so uh, so uh, so uh, trans uh, imperforate hymen so it causes the bulge bulge hymen which is not which is not a finding which is seen in the vaginal septum sir uh, the bulge hymen uh, it covers the vagina which which actually causes the accumulation of menstrual blood okay. it is usually a diagnosis after you completed the operation up your incision is high up it means it was a septum if it is in a lower third it was a imperforate hymen thank you prakya have you seen attempted any operative you must have been uh, attempted this procedure na hymenectomy but suppose usually such patient yes. comes mostly in early age group after as a case of primary amenorrhea so can you tell me what precaution you should take when you operate such cases when patient comes with imperforated hymen huge hematometra hematocolitis and you are taken operative surgery what simple measures we should take when we operate such cases um ma'am which um sorry ma'am so when we operate such case first of all you never push from above okay you just take a small cruciate incision and just allow to drain out the blood whatever collected in the vagina and the uterine cavity so these are the things simple that is the things we have to monitor okay we have to do when we do the operative surgeries okay ma'am okay ma'am thank you judges um, now i'll call the next next speaker dr supriti gharai dr supriti are you there yes please share your screen and start your presentation you can start now
डॉक्टर सुप्रीति यस मैम यस मैम इज इट विजिबल मैम यस इट इज विजिबल Is there any issue? Please start. Yes, Dr. Supriti. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a minute, ma'am. As we already uh, running short of time, beta. Please start. And we are seeing the slide. Please just read it out. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. This is uh, Dr. Supriti J R Tuk from Pravara Rural Hospital. Ma'am, today I am presenting a case on the cervical fibroid. Ma'am, uh, this patient is a 37-year-old married uh, who is P2 L1 B1 previous to FTND vaginally delivered at home. She had a bilateral spa, uh, but she has a complaint. With something coming out of vagina since one month and a foul-smelling PV discharge since one week, she uh, has no complaints of menstruation or any other related problems. So when we examined her for uh, abdominal, there was no palpable mask. Uh, so it was soft and non-tender. For speculum, there was a smooth, globular, single mask uh, with a glistening surface. It was reddish in appearance, which we did on touch. There was uh, and the lowermost part was very soft. Cervix was irregular, and the only posterior lip was visible. Rest all were uh, having erosions in it. Per vaginum, when we did bimanual uh, examination, uterus were bulky, and the mass could be easily reposited back into the vagina. We also did a USG abdo pelvis. of uterus cervical fibroid with possibility of lower cervical fibroid supported with the vascularity on the doctor pap smear was sent but it was inconclusive a uh, patient we therefore a uh, patient was posted for exploratory laparoscopic hysterectomy with bilateral salpingectomy intraoperatively we found there was a 10 by 10 cm uh, fibroid in the cervix in the anterior lip of the cervix which was having a capsule and it could be easily separated from a cervix from the whole of the mask uh, was obscuring the cervix but there was a 1 cm cervical opening in the ostia there was a pedunculated mask of 6 by 4 cm arising from the cervix suggestive of a polyp 2 cm fibroids which was seen uh, in the in the uh, intramural it was in the muscular of the uterus as well as in the cervix And also simple hyperplasia of the uterine muscles was seen. The results had come, and it was suggested of hyperkeratosis, ecchymosis, cervical leiomyoma, and cervical polyp, which also showed uh, there was a endometrial hyperplasia with intramural fibroid of the myometrium. Page fifty-seven, tissues were removed. And it was healthy. She was asked for a follow-up after two weeks of the operation. Uh, Ma'am, we went. Ma'am, the discussion. Uh, usually, supravaginal fibroids may be interstitial, uh, but rarely it is polyploid. Fibroid, uh, cervical fibroids may be classified as an anterior, posterior, lateral, and central. Usually, the anterior fibroids will compress the urinary bladder and cause the urinary frequency or urinary retention. Whereas the lateral fibroids will cause uh, expansion into the uh, broad ligaments. The posterior will cause posterior fibroids usually compress the rectum, and there is a constipation problem. And the central ones will expand equally to all the sides, but usually urinary bladder. जब देखो, thirty-five में देने, तो नहीं ही जब आप बोलेंगे ना, 
Sir, please unmute yourself. Nitin, sir, please unmute yourself. Sorry. Yes, yes, you speak better. Yes, ma'am. Uh, whereas the central fibroids will usually expand equally, but it will usually cause the urinary bladder compression, causing again urinary symptoms like retention and frequency. The treatment modality is either myomectomy or total abdominal hysterectomy. Wherever the uterus and ureters are in close contact with the fibroids, the, they are extra capsular. Only one minute. Start, start. Yes, ma'am. Um, Preoperatively, if we give gonadotropins analog uh, for three months, it will help in the operative blood loss as well as it will facilitate the surgery easier. The recovery is, all, is also better in such cases. Principle is how it was to follow during surgeries e nucleation followed by hysterectomy. Uh, report here a case of huge anterior cervical fiber of 10 by 10 centimeter and polypoidal fiber protruding from a cervical canal up to the introitus. Uh, the total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral falpingectomy was done. I also want to tell you, intraoperative, we had a uh, uh, we had a finding that the fibroid was so big, huge that it was actually uh, fanning out the uterosacral ligaments. So uh, um, the ureters were lateralized, and the whole of the sacrum was taken at once. And then it was clamped and ligated properly so that the anatomy was restored properly. And it was um, a better visualization for the surgeon also and the restoration of the anatomy, anatomical structure. So I conclude here by saying if there is a proper uh, preoperative, intraoperative evaluation, preparation, and knowledge of the anatomical structures, the, the performance, the, perform the operating uh, hysterectomy is more easier. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take questions from the judges now. I have a question. Uh, what precautions were taken to avoid injury to the ureters as you said that uh, they were stretched out? Ma'am, to avoid the injury, first of all, uh, the ureters were identified properly and then uh, they were uh, just to avoid the clamping or any injury to the uterus. The, the surgeon had actually lateralized it to the side side of the wall, pelvic wall, and then clamps were attached to the to the uterosacral ligaments. Okay, Supriti. In such cases, you also come across other than injuries to the bladder, ureter. You also come across with the most common complication is hemorrhage. Can you tell me some tricks that we can take before starting surgery for such cases? Can you listen? Can you hear my question? What precaution you should take to prevent hemorrhage during surgery for such a large fibroids? Um, uh, we can give gonadotropin analogs before the surgery uh, for three months. The uh, fibroid is shrinking and uh, there's a blood uh, bloodless operation in it. So that the field of vision of the operation is more clearer and uh, blood loss is less. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Supriti. Now our next uh, next uh, uh, presenter is Dr. Guru Prasad Guru Shimpi. Uh -huh. Uh, good morning, judges. Uh, I'm Dr. Professor. I'm from uh, Pravara Rural Medical College, Lodi. <laughs> please, please share your screen with us. Yeah, That's yeah. Uh, Dr. Supriti, can you please turn off your screen? Yes. Dr. Supriti, please stop sharing. I you 
request all the participants. Yeah, I request all the participants to be ready with your presentation on your screen. Yes, I'm so ready. That we don't no, no, I just wait, just wait, Shikala. Uh, Piyush, can you uh, can you just uh, stop sharing from uh, Supriti's Supriti's laptop? Piyush, yeah. yes, fine. Uh, um, today I am uh, presenting a, a rare case of advanced stage choriocarcinoma in a teenage girl. Choriocarcinoma is a rare, highly malignant neoplasm of the gestational trophoblast of the placenta, which usually presents as abnormal uterine bleeding. This tumor often demonstrates rapid hematogenous, uh, hematogenous spread to the multiple organs and good response to the chemotherapy. Approximately 30% of the choriocarcinoma patients exhibit metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Diagnosis, which may be attributable to the high affinity exhibited by trophoblastic cells for the blood vessels. The most common metastatic sites of choriocarcinoma are lungs, vagina, pelvis, and liver. Cerebral metastasis occur in 10% of the cases. Despite the aggressive nature of the cure uh, remains possible if it is treated at an early stage, notably following the treatment. Uh, choriocarcinoma is a rare form of cancer which occurs in the female genital tract and is commonly associated with pregnancy. It may develop after a normal pregnancy. However, it is usually associated with molar pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy, miscarriage or abortion. These cases present with the vaginal bleeding, anemia, hyperemesis gravidum, hyperthyroidism, uterine and ovarian enlargement and pregnancy induced hypertension. Here is a case, teenage girl 18 years old was brought to Pravara Rural Hospital Loni with complaints of severe breathlessness and generalized weakness for three months. She also had history of loss of weight and loss of appetite since three months. She had not consulted any medical facility before. She had a preterm vaginal delivery followed by an abortion for which curatage was done two years back. She, di she did not have any follow-up visit after the curatage. As her breathlessness was, got aggravated, she was brought to hospital in the moribund state. She was conscious, oriented, breathless, and cachexic in appearance. She weighed 24 kgs and her BMI was 10.3 kg per meter square. Generalized, uh, general examination revealed pallor and crepitations were heard on respiratory examination. Abdomen was caphoid. Abdominal aortic pulsations were seen. Uterus was just palpable. Cardiovascular system and pelvic examination revealed no significant uh, frequent abnormality. Blood investigations revealed blood hemoglobin level of uh, H HB 7.3 gram per DL. Serum beta HCG level was 3 lakh 33 uh, 30,000 international unit and serum TSH of 0.015 T3 level of 3.34 nanogram per ml and T4 uh, 24.9 microgram per deciliter. Abdominal and pelvic uh, USG showed bulky uterus with heterogeneous content approximately 200 cc in endometrial cavity with free fluid in pelvis and bilateral mild pleural effusion. Chest radiography showed extensive uh, canon ball up appearance in both lung fields, suggestive of extensive metastasis. Patient was kept in MICU uh, with ventilatory support. She was given blood transfusion and higher antibiotics. She was taken for a diagnostic, a diagnostic curatage. She had cardiac arrest on operation, operation table. She was revived and shifted back to ICU. Her endometrial, uh, endometrial histopathological examination showed choriocarcinoma. Un unfortunately, patient did not make it to the treatment. Uh, okay. Choriocarcinoma is a rare, highly malignant uh, neoplasm of the gestational tropoblast of the placenta, which usually presents as the abnormal uterine bleeding. The tumor often demonstrates uh, rapid hematogenous spread to multiple organs and good response to chemotherapy. Approximately 30% of the uh, choriocarcinoma patients exhibit metastasis at the time of diagnosis, which may be attributable to the high affinity exhibited by trophoblastic cells for blood vessels. The most common metastatic sites for choriocarcinoma are lungs, vagina, pelvic, uh, pelvis, and liver. Cerebral metastasis occur in 10% of the cases. Desp despite aggressive nature of the disease, a cure remains possible if it is treated at an early stage. Notably, following treatment with multi-agent therapy re uh, regimens, choriocarcinoma patients are expected to achieve complete or prolonged remission. Thank you. Okay, Guru Prasad. Yes. We will take your... questions from the general.
Our patient was done a cure attach two years back. Yes, sir. What do you feel is the reason for chorio carcinoma? Uh, sir, uh, in this case, patient had one pre uh, preterm vaginal delivery and followed by a cure attach. Yes. Uh, and the uh, her uh, age age itself is a uh, like patient is 18 years old okay she she has and come at a stage to you yes sir so can it be some problem at that curatage level uh years back did it have an origin at that time uh, sir uh, proper follow up she she didn't have a proper follow up after the curatage and uh, sir she was there was no proper history regarding the previous previous cure attach whether it was a normal pregnancy or any molar pregnancy it was not known okay was it a missed abortion at that time yes sir patient gives the history of missed abortion uh, matlab yeah. relatives had given but there was no proper diagnosis to tell that whether it was a molar or a, it was missed abortion any histopathology report was available at that time uh, sir previous uh, pregnancy there were no histopathological uh, available as patient had come in a very cachexic state and uh, uh, only one actually relative was available with the patient when she had come to the casualty okay, thank you okay guru prasad uh, can yes, you tell me about uh, who prognostic scoring system regarding this chorio carcinoma uh, yes ma'am uh, uh, who uh, who prognostic uh, uh criteria regarding the chorea carcinoma it is mainly dependent on the patient's age and uh, patient's uh, previous pregnancies and the metastatic site and number of metastases and uh, that's all mommy okay so which chemotherapy agency has received in your case no ma'am ma we couldn't give, we wanted to revive the patient and then we could start the uh, combination therapy to the patient but uh, the patient could not uh, could not uh, survive in this case uh, the uh, combination therapy like with uh, etoposide with bleomycin wincrest uh, wincrestin uh, chemotherapy could be started once the patient uh, was stabilized okay. we should start a macro regime for because he must be long to higher score Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. But it should it will be the ideal treatment for that lady. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? So we'll move on to our next uh, participant, Dr. Lubna Sadaf. Dr. Lubna. Are you there, Doctor Lubna? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Hello. Share your yes. screen, Lubna. Share Lugna, your screen. Start your presentation. Share your screen. Uh, good morning. I am uh, Doctor Lubna, a uh, second year resident from Pravara Rural Hospital, Loni. I am going to present a okay, uh, case report on cephalocentesis in fetal hydrocephalus. Uh, alternative to cesarean section in a cases of obstructed labor. Uh, cephalocentesis is a procedure by which the excess uh, CSF is drained from the fetal skull uh, with hydrocephalus, thereby permitting vaginal delivery. It's a rare procedure which is offered to a pregnant patients having a hydrocephalic fetus, which is expected to have a poor prognosis after delivery, such as stillbirth or early neonatal death. Look, uh, we are not seeing your uh, uh, peep, uh, poster. Because you have taken lots of efforts and just uh, disturbing. You start your presentation. We are hearing, but you uh, in between you try to share it. Start. Uh, yes, at uh, we got a case of a twenty-four year old female, gravida three para two, living to uh, from Putamba Rural Hospital. She was referred in view of a breech delivery with obstructed aftercoming head of breech. Uh, with, uh, on examination, there was a fetal uh, trunk, shoulders uh, were delivered, and there was obstructed head with absent port pulsations. Uh, ultrasound, uh, we tried for vaginal delivery, but, uh, but uh, we couldn't deliver the head. Ultrasound was done. Uh, in the ultrasound, it uh, showed a gross hydrocephalus and um, thinned out para brain parenchyma. Amount of uh, CSF could not be measured. And then decision decision of cephalocentesis was taken after informed consent from the patient. 
CSA first uh, spinal needle was introduced at the C2 C3 vertebra. So between the C2 C3 vertebra and approximately 2 to 2.5 liters of CSA was drained uh, post procedure, uh, post procedure, and the baby was delivered. After that, the head size significantly reduced, and the baby was delivered vaginally. Uh, so cesarean section was avoided in this case. And uh, post uh, procedure, the like, patient was stable and it was uneventful. Yeah. Now, discussion fetal hydrocephalus is the excessive accumulation of CSF in the brain with incidence of 0 0.3 to 2.5% per, uh, per thousand life births. It's associated with poor fetal outcome. Abnormalities is incompatible with survival, but it is also it will also make the vaginal del delivery impossible due to large fetal head. Uh, so, so cephalocytosis can be offered. It's a critical procedure that is intended to decrease the maternal morbidity due to uh, when uh, fetal life prognosis is poor or incomp incompatible with survival. Uh, conclusion. Transabdominal cephalocentesis is another substitute procedure for decompressing the fetal head as it requires a skilled obstetrician and it's an invasive procedure. Uh, Transvaginal cephalos trans cephalocentesis can be safely and effectively done in the patients with fetal hydrocephalus and it requires skill and can be easily utilized and maternal morbidity can be avoided due to cesarean delivery. This we also emphasize on the importance of prenatal diagnosis, especially in developing countries to look for associated malformations and need for early referral to tertiary care center and aim at reducing both maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. Okay. Hello. You are finished? Yes, ma'am. Okay, in this case, what are the way of approach through vaginally you want to drain the CSF? How will you approach? Up. What we did, ma'am? Uh -huh. Ma'am, actually when patient presented to us, we tried, first mainly we tried for vaginal delivery. It was actually an undiagnosed case of hydrocephalus because she did not have any al previous ultrasound report. There was no follow-up to like uh, previous ANC visits were not there. Uh, so we tried for vaginal delivery, but uh, after attempts, after two and a half hour of attempt, it was uh, like not delivering. So we went for uh, ultrasound guided uh, uh, like examination, and in that we got to know it was a gross hydrocephalus, and we attempted uh, uh, cephalocentesis under the ultrasound guidance. We have introduced the spinal needle into between the C2 C3 vertebra, and we drained the uh, cerebrospinal fluid approximately two to two point five liters. Okay. Under USG guidance. Okay. Okay. Any questions or shall Do I call we have uh, more questions? Sorry, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, judges. Uh, our next participant Thank is Dr. Sirija. Please share your screen. Dr. Sirija is there? Yes, yeah, please share your screen. Lubna, stop uh, screen sharing. Piyush, from your side only, stop sharing. Good morning, ma'am. I'm yeah. Dr. Sirija. Can you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just start it. We are, we are seeing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I'm Dr. Vansi Sirisha, uh, junior resident from Prabhra Rural Hospital, Loni. Uh, today, I hereby present uh, a rare uh, case of chronic rupture, corneal ectopic, which is an obstetric emergency. Uh, coming on to the introduction, ectopic pregnancies occurs when fertilized egg implants outside the normal uterine cavity. Corneal ectopic pregnancy is a rare condition and its incidence uh, accounts approximately 2 to 4% of all the ectopic pregnancies. 
it it remains most difficult to diagnose due to its low specificity of symptoms uh in case of uh, in case of corneal ectopic pregnancy uh one should keep any clinician should keep early diagnosis and timely management are the two keywords for a proper management of this case um uh, the corneal ectopic pregnancy develops in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube invading through the uterine wall with this uh, introduction i would like to present a case scenario where a 19 year old girl tiny gravida was referred from outside hospital with ultrasound showing rupture right corneal or tubal ectopic with hemoperitoneum patient uh, clinically seems to patient seems to be vitally stable and gives history of chronic pain abdomen since one month and spotting for vagina uh, since uh, since 15 to 20 days on examination pulse of the patient is 90 beats per minute and dp is 1074 spo2 is 97% of o2 patient seems to be vitally stable but clinically seems to be very pale so all the all routine investigations were sent and emergency bedside ultrasound was done and we found out to be ruptured right corneal ectopic with ruptured uterine fundus with hemoperitoneum with no more delay patient was taken to emergency exploratory laparotomy with ongoing pcv transfusion the following are the intraoperative findings we found ruptured uterine fundus which is also quite necrosed with multiple blood clots adherent to the large bowel and bladder bilateral fallopian tubes were congested and necrosed and adherent to surrounding structures so we have no other option left just to, but to do bilateral salpingectomy along with necrosed part of the uterine fundus was removed along with the cornea and on remaining parts were resutured around 1 liter of hemoperitoneum with multiple blood clots were drained and uh, in order to control the excessive blood loss we have to write like the right internal iliac artery uh patient uh, drain number 32 was inserted into the abdominal cavity and patient uh, uh patient was discharged um, drain was removed on the post operative day 3 and patient was discharged on post operative day 7 with no more complications coming on to the discussion of con corneal ectopic pregnancy by definition corneal ectopic pregnancy is defined as implantation and development of gestational sac in one of the upper and lateral portions of the uterus in this uh, in this corneal ectopic pregnancy the gestational sac uh, which is implanted is develop a will be developing within the myometrium the myometrium is quite distensible but only up to some extent so uh, the corneal ectopic pregnancy rupture presents quite late when compared to the other ectopic pregnancies usually the uh, rupture occurs around late first trimester to early second trimester that is 7 to 12 7 to 14 weeks of a, uh, gestational age by uh, due to which it become, it uh, makes even more uh, complicated for any uh, obstetrician to diagnose this case and by the time we diagnose already the significant loss has been occurred um sometimes the, this this is why clinicians sometimes use corneal ectopic pregnancy interchangeable with interstitial ectopic pregnancies due to which all these complications which makes this corneal ectopic pregnancy a catastrophic uh, event and leading up to the mortality of 2% due to the adverse therapeutic options available uh, nowadays due to advanced uh, science and technology three dimensional ultrasound allows to diagnose accurately corneal ectopic pregnancy but there are other medical and uh, surgical management uh, available to treat this condition depending upon the but mainly depends upon the condition of the uh, patient if the patient uh, presents to us early and if we can diagnose the corneal ectopic pregnancy before its rupture and the patient is vitally stable then we can go on to the medical uh, options like uh, methotrexate and uh, kcl uh, infusion only one minute remaining and, uh, yes ma'am and but if the patient uh, is uh, clinically unstable with ruptured uterus hysterectomy hysterectomy with exploratory laparotomy or the surgical uh, methods of choice so conclusion is corneal ectopic pregnancy has the high risk of maternal mortality and needs to be identified at the earliest to prevent the fatal complications the risk of uterine rupture and repeated ectopic pregnancies increases and patient uh, so hence careful observation of these women in further uh, pregnancies and consideration of elective cesarean section is strongly recommended in this in this case thank you
Yes. Can we have Dr. questions, please? Yes, Dr. Srija, you said yes, these patients topic have catastrophic hemorrhages. Yes, sir. W what is the reason for this? So the reason for this is uh, the corneal ectopic pregnancies uh, are very lately diagnosed, sir. Yes. And uh, uh, and due to uh, the uh, the pregnancies uh, pregnancies within the uh, within the uterine only. So ultrasound may also it is sometimes misdiagnosed, sir. At what gestational age did this ectopic rupture? Sir. In your case, what was the gestational age? Sir, when... sir it is uh, ten weeks, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I Can have you... a question. Uh, yes, I have a question. Why was the uh, other tube also necrosed? I didn't get the answer for that. She said that both the tubes were uh, necrosed and that's why the uh, salpingate tube was done. Bilateral salpingate has to be yeah, done. But, when... but why was the other tube also necrosed? The reason, that reason I want to ask it. Mom, uh... But in our case, the patient has been actually referred from outside, ma'am. And uh, the patient has been on chronic rupture ectopic, ma'am. Because she's saying that weight, ignore, the, uh, since one month, she's having weight abdominal pain and uh, spotting BV and all these things. Because of one month, uh, because of uh, chronic uh, ruptured uterus, maybe blood supply has been hampered and maybe leading to necrosis. Okay. Any more questions or shall I call our last participant? I would like to call Dr. Aishwarya Thakare for her uh, poster presentation. Dr. Aishwarya. Yes, ma'am. A very good morning to our esteemed judges and my fellow delegates. I, Dr. Aishwarya Pradeep Thakare, would like to present you a rare case report of cystic hygroma. Cystic hygroma first described in the European by Redden Barker in 1828 is a proliferation of thin wall lymphatic vascular tissues that may or may not be filled with lymph fluid. Also known as cystic lymphangioma, its incidence is estimated to be 1 in 800 pregnancies and 1 in 6,000 to 8,000 live births. It is rare and often progresses to high drops and causes fetal death. The survival rate of antenatally diagnosed cystic hygroma has been reported as 2 to 3 percent. I report the case of antenatally diagnosed large cystic hygroma in a newborn female delivered successfully. A 23 years old G3A2 with 40 weeks, three days of gestational age was referred to us from PHC in view of multicystic structure of 13 into 11 centimeter in the left axillary region with no solid component or vascularity within suggestive of cystic hygroma diagnosed antenatally on ultrasonography. Patient presented with pain in the lower abdomen, acute and onset, scanty mucoid blood stain discharge per vagina. It was her first visit to our hospital and her past medical or family history were unremarkable. On examination, the vitals were stable with no abnormality in her general systemic examination and her routine blood urine investigations were normal. In view of the potential for shoulder dystocia and obstructed labor, a female baby of 3.6 kgs with APGA score being 8 and 9 at 1 minute and 5 minutes of life respectively was delivered by an emergency lower segment cesarean section. Clinically, she was noted to have a soft cystic, brilliantly trans axillary mass measuring 14 into 12 centimeters extending to the left anterior chest wall. No other anomalies were noted even on the chest radiograph. The baby was admitted in an ICU for observation for 7 days. The pediatric con surgery consultation was taken and as the baby was asymptomatic and no urgent management was required, she was asked to follow up after 15 days. Post-delivery mother was treated conservatively with antibiotics, analgesics and other supportive treatment and was discharged on 7th day after suture removal. Cystic hygroma is a benign congenital malformation of the lymphatic system that has its genesis in the lack of development of communication between the lymphatic and the venous system. 80% of cystic hygromas occur in the neck, usually in the posterior cervical triangle, while the other side sites include the axilla, superior mediastinum, mesenters, retroperitoneal region, pelvis, and lower limbs. Cystic hygromas may be associated with Turner syndrome, Noonan syndrome, trisomies, cardiac anomalies, and fetal hydrops. The complications include infection, bleeding, and airway compromise. 
Fetal axillary cystic hygromas have been reported rarely and usually as a sonographic finding in mid gestation. On an ultrasonological scan, it appears as a hypoechogenic multilocular cystic mass with septa of variable thickness. Unlike hemangioma, a cystic hygroma fails to light up on color Doppler examination. The magnetic resonance imaging permits better tissue characterization and provides a better estimate of tumor extent. Fetal karyotype may be undertaken for providing accurate diagnosis and genetic counseling. Sonolog sonological evaluation should also be undertaken for the detection of fetal skin edema, ascites, pleural and pericardial effusion, and cardiac or renal anomalies. The differential diagnosis also include high thoracic meningomyelocele and limb body wall complex. As cystic hygromas are known to lead to obstructed labor and neonatal asphyxia, an elective cesarean section should be considered as the preferred mode of delivery. These babies should be delivered at centers equipped to offer emergency neonatal ventilatory care. As these tumors do not resolve spontaneously, surgical excision of the tumor and affected tissues should be undertaken in case of large cystic hygroma, though the infiltration of vital structures makes the surgical excision difficult. Recurrences are known to occur even after presumed total surgical excision. Sclerosing agents like bleomycin and OK432, inactivated streptococcal organism, can be injected directly. Conclusion, the outcome of pregnancy with cystic hygroma with normal karyotype and a normal anomaly scan is good. Hence, it is important for providing detailed prenatal counseling to couples for classification of cystic hygroma and management of their pregnancies. Thank you. Okay. Aishwarya, can you tell me what is the basic pathophysiology in cystic hygroma? What, why, why this happens? Uh, Ma'am, it is a congenital malformation of the lymphatic system. Actually, it occurs uh, in eight week, around eight week of uh, gestation when uh, during embryonic development. And uh, ma'am, there is lack of development and communication between the lymphatic and the venous systems. So, in short, it is an abnormal lymphatic drainage system. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. What is this lymphatic problem? Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, any other parameter by which you could have diagnosed this earlier? Uh, Ma'am, uh, if she would come to us uh, during her antenatal visits, uh, her uh, uh, NT scan uh, would have given us uh, information regarding her congenital anomalies or nonucleoides. Uh, anomaly scan also should be diagnosed. And uh, ma'am, to uh, rule out congenital anomalies, we can uh, do amniocentesis as well to detect genetic abnormalities, if any. Fetal 2D echo can also be done to rule out if there are, there are any cardiac anomalies. What was the prognosis of this case? Uh, so the baby is uh, successfully delivered, sir, and the baby is uh, at home right now. Uh, baby is supposed to get followed up after 15 days. Okay. For next pregnancy, did you give any advice to this patient? Uh, sir, we have uh, actually uh, advised them regarding karyotyping to be done initially if uh, and to rule out genetic abnormalities before the conception, like during the conception or before the conception. Thank you. Welcome Thank you so sir. much, Aishwarya. Uh, Piyush, Thank can you, you uh, allow me to share the screen? Yeah, ma'am. Try no, ma'am. I don't know. Uh, I thank our esteemed judges, Dr. Anjali Patil, ma'am. Uh, she's a consultant OBGY and practicing infertility since almost more than 30 years. And uh, always uh, she's with us at Satara. Uh, our next esteemed uh, panelist, Dr. Manisha Laddad, ma'am. She's associate professor at Kim's Karan, and she's almost having more than 30 publications on her name. And uh, our And I also thank Dr. Amit Naik sir. Sir is professor and HOD at SMBT. Uh, I'm, I'm SRC Nasik. I really thank you all. 
and now i call upon uh, and please piyush uh, give a online bouquet to everyone can you uh, do it piyush i said i am thankful to you ma'am you dr lard sir and your whole team for organizing such a nice uh, presentation all the students have performed very nicely so thank you once again thank you thank you very much ma'am thank you uh, piyush can you uh, give online bouquet or shall i uh, or you are not able to do it yeah i'll say congratulations reshma madam for wonderful you, conduct sir. of this poster presentation thank you thank you, sir. thank you thank you nitin lard sir the first for giving us this opportunity yeah this is online bouquet to our uh, esteemed judges thank you so much thank, thank, you, you. thank you thank you thank you uh, thank now you. i call upon uh, dr neha ma'am uh, to say few words uh, and then dr kanchan disle ma'am will uh, have few words with us dr neha ma'am uh hello can you hear me yeah. yes ma'am yes ma hello yes 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 congratulations uh, everyone all the uh, students who have presented their papers and posters it was a very good beginning for them and a very good uh, presentations i was surprised with some ivf papers who have done a great job at such a young age i wish all of them a lot of success and bright future ahead i i congratulate and i say a thanks to all my judges who have done a very wonderful job for few of the judges we have informed them in a very with a very short notice and they have really done a good job dr ami dr ladar ma'am uh, dr anjali patil dr nalini madam in the morning hours so i really thanks all of them thank you ma'am now i call upon i think ma'am's connection is uh, i call upon dr kanchan desle ma'am organizing chairperson of 30 fest 2022 dr kanchan yes yeah thank you it has been a pleasure uh, been a pleasure with you all with the 31st all today as a co chair person of 31st 2022 and in, as a nogs president it has been an honor to uh, honor to arrange such a beautiful uh, cme and all everything that is paper presentation and encouraging all your newcomers uh really it is such a busy day all everybody join in the morning hours and uh, one minute i will start my okay uh, really in a such a busy day everybody join in the morning hours in the spotify's conference and uh, really all the newcomers they have done very well job within adding the tool like color doppler for uterus before uh, transfer of the embryos the volume of the ovary in uh, volume of the ovary they are very important in ivf cycles mm -hmm. uh, then other uh, things that is mirror syndrome robbers uh, uterus everything was very very uh, fantastic uh, all i congratulate all the members who have joined and uh, basically reshma madam who has given so time and very arranged nicely dr kiran patore dr nalini bagol dr arun more dr ujwala bhamri dr manisha dr amit dr swastika all they gave their time <laughs> for our conference really i am very thankful for them you, and uh, in a such a uh, short time they all were available and uh, uh, really i thank to all uh, definitely you all all welcome for the next two days in the grape city of wine uh, for enjoying the uh, both uh, uh, both for the enjoyment all well, as well as knowledge for the uh, for the future thank you very much reshma madam and thank you very much nitin lard sir thank you thank you thank you so much and i much. conclude officially this uh, paper presentation uh, thank you thank you everybody. thank you ma'am thank you uh, thank, uh, reshma thanks for taking lot of efforts and i have just got disconnected it in between thanks yes. a lot
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You are really, you are you are really done a very commendable job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. 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 And yes. this was our first uh, flower of the uh, garment like that. So definitely everybody is very happy yes. to announce that our uh, conference started today. Thank you very much. Yes. As an opening yes. batsman, we uh, I have yeah. we all have done a century, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, definitely yes. all. Yes. Uh, will very good, it. very all good, are, very good, Ashma. Yes. All are welcome. Yes. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good day. Uh, and same. we are waiting for we are waiting for you on 26th of uh, this march for the gala academic program and banquet yes me and anjali ma'am coming together yes 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 anjali madam thank you